Those polo people at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that comes next month. I have a hard time in the middle of the summer. Yeah, I don't <laughs> well, that water is never swimmable. Remember that? Right. Everybody, we are live. Yeah. 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 Thank you for joining us this evening. Today is January 6th, and uh, this is our first meeting in the new year. We want to wish everyone a happy new year and welcome aboard tonight. Uh, this is, the, uh, as I said, the January 6th, 2015 meeting of the Municipal Budget Committee. And if we would all rise and pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have a lot of company with us tonight, because tonight we're going to begin the review of the Warren articles. So quickly going around the room with new estate rep, if you would begin. Brian Lapham. Richard Bernier. Jerry Zanoy. John Rice, Secretary. Eileen Latimer, Chairman. Mike Wolf. Stephen LeBranch. Jones. Bob Ladd. Glenn Farrell. Mike Pierce. Jim Wardell. Jim mm -hmm. O'Loughlin. Thank you, everyone. And I think what we'll do is we'll start tonight kind of like where we left off in the season with um, our schools. And welcome, Superintendent Murphy, and welcome, Nathan. And I'm going to let you lead off. You do such an excellent job. You can settle us all down and give us the Warren articles that are being proposed and put before the voters. And um, I'll let you open up with that. Thank you for time this evening. Uh, we speak on behalf of, the, obviously, the Hampton School Board. And uh, the warrants that you'll see tonight uh, were voted by the school board unanimously uh, to bring forth um, as their proposal for the warrant for 2015. So uh, Nathan and I will address any of the questions, although there are members of the board with us tonight. Um, our chair, um, Ginny Bridal, uh, Rusty Bridal is there, uh, Pepper Ring, um, of course Jerry's sitting at the table tonight. Um, and Mrs. Shepard was unable to make it this evening. She's not feeling well. As everybody experiences the, f the flu or the virus, uh, it, it, it's getting to everyone. Uh, but we're here tonight to review uh, the five warrants. Um, again, the board voted unanimously to bring these forward. And uh, Nathan will have some more detail as we walk through a very short PowerPoint um, where it will a answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we're just thrilled to be here, and uh, I think that you've seen some of this from our last meeting in December, so this should, uh, so most of the ver verbiage in these warrants will look familiar to you with some, some changes as we finalize some of the numbers uh, late in late December. So I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, and he will give you the information you need. Thank you very much. Good evening. In your hands, folks, is an 11-page document. Uh, the warrant is first up. I, I included page three, even though it's not really relevant, but I thought it would be important just to draw attention to the fact that we have our non-board officers uh, being elected this year. Their three-year terms are up, moderator, clerk, and treasurer. As well, there are two seats open uh, for three-year terms. What follows that are the slides that are relevant tonight, the revenue sheet as it exists, and an executive summary that I know you've seen and liked in the past. So uh, I'll walk you through the articles. Article number one you dealt with at your last meeting. I think, so I'm not sure you want to take action tonight. Uh, <coughs> article 1 is the operating budget, which was proposed at $20,061,260. It represented a 2.25% increase, 1.75% of that being default, and the extra half a percent requested items. So article number 2, if I click right along, is, uh, is the negotiated agreement between the Hampton School Board and the Paraprofessionals Association, the CESPA, Seacoast Educational Su uh, Support Professional Association. Uh, I won't read the language to you, but you have it both in the warrant and in the slides. It is a four-year agreement. And so well, without wanting to read my slide to you, let me just bullet for you that four years means we essentially skip a negotiating session. It's better than two, even better than three. Uh, it, it certainly will help be uh, you know, more predictable for this staff. There are in this class some 34, 5, or 6 
folks who are all essentially part-time, working less than 35 hours, some of them working fewer hours than that. We have some half-time, quote-unquote, folks that are in that package. We reduced the posting burden. It was a 14-day post. Now we're down to five school days. Really, we don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of internal folks seeking these positions, uh, but the five-day assist, because many of these positions that come open are special needs related, and it's important that we quickly find the right fit and move forward. We modified the sick leave rollover. Uh, we've had sick leave as a benefit underneath this, this uh, agreement, but the rollover was really constricting in terms of allowing staff to be able to amass any accumulated leave. There is no provision for payout of leave when you, uh, when you terminate your employment or retire. But it was important to the board and to the union that we seek some mechanism that will allow them to accrue <coughs> some leave so that they could carry themselves to the 90-day waiting period for long-term disability. We have no short-term disability mechanism in place. That's what sick leave was for, but they were only able to carry six days. So there are provisions in this language that allow them to now accrue, which we also believe will be a, a disincentive, if you will, to burning through all those days because in the absence of being able to carry them they were using them at a clip of 90 plus percent the last year or so but so that I'm clear and I don't mean to interrupt yep. you that's just a carryover and it's not a payout it's not a payout yeah thank you we clarified leaves in terms of extended leave of absence and jury duty there's now an extended leave of absence that has tentacles only that allow up to a year of, of absence and then a return to a position there's no benefits, uh, no costs to the district in the period of leave, but it allows folks essentially in three categories, uh, uh, rearing of a child, um, uh, uh, medical necessity of a parent, and personal medical necessity, I think, were the three that are in that language. Uh, jury duty, we simply put some simple language in to guide what would happen under jury duty. It, will, it matches practice. Uh, in terms of allowing them to go and be a part of jury duty and then uh, find their position still here. We spent a lot of time talking about the lunch period, if you can imagine, and modified that by a couple of minutes and simply said the employee lunch should match the student lunch in each of the buildings. Uh, those are some of the smaller things. Maybe the single greatest thing uh, for the district moving in to the negotiations was that we have had a practice in place for some number of years whereby these hourly employees have equalized pay, if I can call it that. You take their hourly rate times the number of hours per day times the number of days they work in a school year, come up with a number, then divide it equally over 21 checks, which is not lawful, not legal, according to the Department of Labor. <laughs> uh, you can certainly overpay them anytime you like, but you can't underpay them. And the net result was on a week or on a bi-weekly pay when they might take they might have worked 10 days they were really only getting paid for 8.7 days the way it works out over time and so it was important to us that that we negotiate some resolution to that uh, we did so by essentially taking all of those paraprofessionals who work in a capacity as kindergarten aid at center school and as regular special ed aides working with identified students throughout the district and we made them salaried and all other classes are hourly. These are not exempt positions. They still have access to overtime, but the, the definition or the classification of them as salaried allows us to pay them in the manner that we have been paying them, and it'll satisfy the Department of Labor when they come knocking. And I tell you that that's important only because the Department of Labor has made it clear to other districts around the state that they are coming knocking. So it was, it was important to address that, and we did. We additionally took a 10-step scale wage scale and reduced it over the course of the four years we reduced it to seven steps in year one and two and to four steps in year three and four uh, that has the benefit of essentially allowing the board to contemplate in future negotiations that when you say you want to offer one percent to the to the class the class gets essentially one percent with a ten step scale with steps and increases included a 1% might turn into a 2.3% or a 3% and a 3% might turn into a 6% because yeah, you have to measure the impact of scale movement or step movement I should say as well. In this case it shortens up the steps which appreciates the fact that although <coughs> there might be lots to be learned in year one and two the union agreed that by the time you reach year three and four you are, are and are expected to be reasonably mature in this role uh, in serving our students. And so it, it may interest you as well that the steps 
were essentially thrown out and then recalculated, and they are calculated as a percentage of the top step. So right now, step one is 85% of step top, and moving forward, it continues to be 85, but in between, we've equalized them, and when we ultimately land at four steps, they represent the top step, and then 95, 90, and 85 percent of that number. Uh, all of that seemed to be agreeable to both sides, and as a, as a part of that, there was also an agreement made that new hires will start always at step one when they join the district. Uh, longevity was a provision that was in the existing language that has been eliminated for new hires moving forward. Uh, existing employees were grandfathered. And the wages that went along with that are two and a quarter in the first year, 1.75% in years two and three, and two and a quarter in the fourth year. That was really driven as, they, as, as the board and the union chased the fluctuations of people moving up steps in that grid and trying to keep the averages consistent across the, 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 the four years in terms of how much people were getting on average. Offsetting some of that is the fact that the, the, uh, the board succeeded in eliminating all the full-time benefit language that was in the contract. Uh, to be candid, that we've worked hard to, I say worked hard, it's been a practice that the, that the paras are hired at less than 35 hours so that full-time benefits were out of reach to all those, to all but those who had been here some significant number of years. But the language was still there and it held out opportunities for a buyout provision. If you don't take the health insurance, um, you have a buyout, for instance. And one of the things that the union came in very ad adamant about was trying to find some affordable health care solution for a small number of their membership that really have need for that. And so what was agreed to was eliminating language that, that spoke to all of the existing coverages that we have with buyouts and 85-15 cost sharing, replaced it with a less expensive plan, an HMO site of service plan at a 75-25 split for the employee only. Uh, employees may buy into dependent coverage, but at 100% their cost. The final cost of this in year one is only $576 more than the $3,000 fine that the board is already prepared to pay under the Affordable Care Act for those who couldn't afford their other coverages and went to the marketplace and purchased there instead. They were pleased with the nature of the plan. It's, it's, it carries a $3,000 deductible and a $25 and $50 copay, uh, but it, it is coverage and decent coverage for those that have no other alternative. So the estimate is that there will be not more than 10 in their membership that would partic participate in this way. Uh, all of that uh, combined, if I go back to the article, adds up to a, a, a new dollar amount of $23,230 in the first year. The numbers run from 19,002 down to 18,007 over the second, third, and fourth years. It was, un it was ratified unanimously by the, by the paraprofessionals union and then uh, unanimously voted by the board and <coughs> that's article number two for your consideration. I've got a lot of questions on that, but just a little clarity if before we do that. The decrease from uh, the 2015-16 budget, that was two and a quarter in that increase? <coughs> yeah. And the operating budget, two and a quarter. 1.75? Is the default element and then another 0.5 percent is in the $98,000 requested dollars. Okay. And what was the cost of legal counsel in negotiations? I, it's almost as though I had set you up for that. I thank you for the question. Um, we were able to do it ourselves. Uh, there were two members of the school board and myself, and we sat down with five representatives of SESPA. There was no legal uh, cost involved at all. So. Another time, another cycle, another you know, another um, situation. It might have been, and we certainly have had significant costs running to five, six, seven, eight thousand or more in previous negotiations with our our teachers union. Um, but we tried really hard, and I think that if you were to ask members of the negotiating team either side, you, they would tell you that it was a very collaborative process. Uh, a lot of it was uh, agreed to by consensus rather than by caucus, and uh, and although it took us longer than we wanted, it was really because we were chasing. We're chasing legalese and definition while at the same time trying hard to do so without bringing lawyers to the table. So, okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you. We also did that with the last teacher contract. We negotiated without any lawyers at the table. 
Um, and so the board has been very clear that they want every effort made uh, to go to the table and to work together in collaborating to come up with solutions to contract language. So um, for the last two sessions that we've sat at the table, as Nathan said, it's worked. We hope to continue that trend, but can't, you can't, you know, you can't guarantee that down the road. But we, the board is We'll adamant. take it when we can get it, and that's, that's I, a very good example of negotiations. Thank you for that. And Thank you. one more point I just want to get clear. This right now covers 43 employees? No, actually, it's 34. 34. And of those, uh, eight of them are, uh, might be 35, actually, but eight of them are federally funded under uh, IDEA. the IDEA grant for special ed services. And there are one, two, three, four others, four others that are funded under Title I. Thank you. All right, Mr. Alapa, would you like to start the question down your end? All set. I'm all set. All set. All set. Likewise. All set, thank you. Good job. Jerry. Jeremy, I accept it. Fine. Good thing. Uh, I got one question. Suppose the voters that are listening decide to go with the default budget. This is a signed contract, so the time, how would you handle it? Why don't you explain it? So, it, if it's a, if, the if voters, this article, yeah. the def, the default budget right now holds today's contributions or today's uh, compensation, so there is no uh, increase in salaries or benefits or changes in benefits that are included in the default budget or the proposed budget. Only in this article number two are there any changes. So. If we ended up with a default budget and this article passed, number two, then the paras would benefit from all of the changes that went into effect. Uh, if we end up with a proposed budget passing and this article passes, they still get the changes. Uh, so they will see a steady state, no matter what happens with the budget, their changes will only come if article number two, this proposed collective bargaining agreement, passes. Great question, though. Thank you. Okay. Nothing can Good job. Thank you. <clears throat> Before I ask one other comment, Eileen, I Absolutely. think it's a good piece of information that when we hire people under the IDEA or any other federal grant, uh, such as Title I that Nathan mentioned, we have to honor the same salary schedule that we honor, that we propose to our <coughs> folks that work under the operation of the Hampton School District. So just so you know that we can't have different salary schedules because they're on, uh, f they're on federal rolls and we receive the money that way. So. It, it, the numbers and, and and the other point is even though Nathan said 34 those numbers can fluctuate mm -hmm. you know with a change in our student population specifically when it comes to youngsters with um, that have um, learning challenges and we have in fact at times had to hire uh, during the course of a year to meet the needs of a youngster so that he can be in his natural he or she can be in their natural setting thank you <clears throat> Before I ask for a motion to accept this, um, I want to let everyone know, remind everyone that the vote um, count will go on the ballot. Right, Fred? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, clearly the voters will see the number by which you voted. Okay, can I have a motion on this? Jerry? Well, I'll make an article one or two or what? Two. Two. <clears throat> Did we pass Article 1? Well, you know what? To clean up one we did in the budget, but it's in here as the Warren article, so why don't we just clean that up and <coughs> one first. Okay, Article 1, I make a motion that we uh, we pass the, uh, the proposed Article 1 budget of $20,061,260. Second. And all those in favor? Opposed? and abstain. Because I apologize for not being here during the discussion of Article 1, so I would prefer to abstain. You were here for the school budget, were you, weren't you? No, that's the one. That's oh, okay, I, I'm sorry, so Richard. I'd rather, I'd okay. rather abstain for a vote on that. Article okay. 
You know, if you ever have any questions, pl please come by the office and see Nate and I. We'd be happy to sit down and go over anything with you in, in anticipation of your public hearing coming up as well as the school board's deliberative session. Uh, so. it, it isn't a criticism. Oh, no, I know that. Oh, I, I absolutely understand that. I wasn't that. here I, and I felt that I yeah, feel no, I would I rather not that, but, make a commitment either but, way. But Nathan and I are committed to making sure that people understand what we right. did propose uh, on behalf of the board. Thank you. And now moving on to two, Jerry, do you want to put that one on? Right, I'll make a m motion that we uh, we approve Article Two, which is the an agreement with the paraprofessionals. Mm -hmm. To recommend uh, to deliberative. And recommend to deliberative session uh, the agreement with the paraprofessional SESPA collective bargaining agreement, which for 2015, uh, 16, 16, and 17, 17, 18, 18, and 19, and represented here, the 15 and 16 impact is 23,230. 16, 17 is 19,244, 17, 18 is 19,908, and 2018 to 2019 is 18,766. Second. 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 Okay, all, all those, over. all those in favor? Aye. Okay, unanimous. Moving on to Article 3. Article number 3 is the long-term maintenance article that was, was created, initiated some, I, I, you know, I wasn't here and, uh, I think I was born, but I, I, I know it's been. I know. Come on, I'm sorry, but it's. I think We're it's been, born. It's been twenty, almost twenty years, maybe eighteen. Uh, there was a significant uh, capital project, capital analysis done, and this was started, and it continues to be a, uh, an outstanding tool for uh, chasing the the, the the facilities needs that we have in the Hampton School District. The language is, uh, as you've seen in the past, it is. Uh, there's a listing of the projects planned for 1516. It's $300,000 uh, non-lapsing for two years to allow us to cross over two summers with our work. I'll move right on to the list of repairs and projects. First at Hampton Academy, $10,000 is allocated for roof repairs. It's plugged in under Hampton Academy, but it's really across the three buildings. And I want you to know that we do infrared roof scans on an annual basis and do all the maintenance and repair that we can. Uh, we just continue to kick the can down the street, I think, really effectively. And I applaud Mr. Lassard for the work that he's done uh, in doing all the repairs uh, that he can on an annual basis to maintain those roofs. We did some work at Center School uh, in the last couple of cycles. And uh, Marston is on the docket uh, coming up in the CIP. But this $10,000 helps to address that. Uh, each year we continue to include a small dollar I itemized for the uh, accessibility and ADA uh, conversation that might arise in any given year, especially at Hampton Academy. There are some concerns there that we continue to try to address and will seek to address with a major renovation. Uh, and the $5,000 that's set aside is not specific to any particular project. It's more to alert the public and to be honest to the fact that if we needed to, to address some significant concern that was expressed or brought to our attention, some number of these dollars might be used for that purpose. Across all three buildings, you'll see <coughs> upgrade perimeter security cameras <coughs> itemized. One of the things that came out of the security analysis and assessment that we did last year uh, with a group of uh, with a, re a group of retired retired professionals in the know, uh, one of the recommendations that came out of that was that we could and should make significant upgrades to our perimeter security in terms of our ability to record and view uh, that which is going on. And I will tell you that we have had a spate of vandalism issues that have happened over the last year that have drawn our attention to the fact that the resolution that we have on the analog cameras at our buildings leaves a lot to be desired given today's standards. They were outstanding tools when they were, when they were implemented, and we're not looking to get rid of any of them. What we are looking to do is, at all three buildings, to upgrade the backbone of our closed-circuit TV system, if you will, our, our, uh, uh, our security cameras, which are all exterior-looking, <coughs> by the way. We don't have any interior cameras right now in terms of watching the, f the movement of students. Remember, we're K-8, and, and, uh, and that's something that I think comes over time, and we certainly have comments made about that in our se uh, security assessment. But right now, what we're looking to do is upgrade to digital our cameras on the outside, take advantage of some new cameras in the best possible positions, reposition our analog cameras, in some cases moving into some of our common areas like our, our lobbies, mm -hmm. and upgrading the back end so that it can capture all of that digital and old analog 
uh, and archive that in a way that is uh, more easily and and uh, and readily accessible and reviewable. So the estimate for that was somewhere right around twenty three thousand dollars per building, and that's a project that we'll tackle in this in in this cycle. Mr. Lassard also asked if we could throw dollars in this uh, year to address painting at Hampton Academy. And I said, well, we're also talking about a renovation project. Let's not waste dollars. He assures me that he's talking about the exterior gable and soffit trim up in an area which should not be affected by any major renovation on the core building. We have not addressed that in some number of years, and it's appropriate to do some stripping and some repainting. Hampton Academy total $50,000. The, the, the biggest projects this year will be at Marston School. First, the bathrooms in the 1975 edition need to be upgraded. That was on the ballot last year with a dollar amount of $88,000. And that number was pegged against the work that we've done in bathroom renovations uh, in two previous projects. The scope at the Marston School on the, the main street there, the 1975 edition, was greater than we had anticipated when we talked about the renovations that needed to be done. To make them handicap accessible, we needed to, or the scope called for expanding the outside wall, which is right now in by six or eight feet from the wall of the classrooms that surround it. So anyway, when the project was bid out, it came back in at close to $180,000. And so we passed on that project. We're asking for $50,000 more to bring the project to somewhere around $135,000 or $140,000. We're, we're backing off on scope some. Uh, looking at opting out of ceramic tiles, et cetera, in the bathroom, going back to cinder block, and doing what we can to bring that project in at that number. So we're asking for this. This is actually the second allocation or appropriation for that project. But that will finish it. Likewise, the parking lot and bus loop was on last year's um, article at $85,000, uh, $95,000. And we're asking for 105000 more. We estimate that at just under two hundred thousand dollars it will be all of the parking that you see at uh, at Marston it won't include the loop that goes out back behind the gym that just doesn't get that much wear and tear but we've had uh, systemic failure across the parking lot and the bus loop so this will dig it up reconstruct it and repave it and we look to do that work this summer with this appropriation added to last year's in the main office, an attached conference room or adjoining conference room at Marston, we don't have air conditioning. We don't have great air quality. That's a space that's occupied 12 months a year. That's where we do student registrations, incoming students that come in over the summer months. So we look to upgrade for $15,000 the air quality and, uh, and conditioning in that area. The perimeter security is noted again for Marston. And then we continue to do work on replacing student lockers uh, now down the fourth grade, we dealt with the third grade wing two cycles ago, uh, and that has been very well received. We're talking about replacing lockers that you can almost put your hand in this way, <laughs> not quite, and replacing them with 15-inch, one up and one down. Uh, a bit of a stretch for a couple of the short third graders, but certainly attainable, uh, reachable for the fourth graders and beyond. So we're allocating $25,000 to continue to replace as many lockers as we can down that fourth grade wing. $218,000 the total appropriation with regard to Marston School. And then at Center School, start the work on some classroom sinks and countertops which are showing their age as they're, they're peeling and, and failing. $9,000 allocated to, to tackle as many classrooms as we can in that regard along with the perimeter security cameras at $32,000 total. That's the $300,000 for this year's long-term maintenance article. Would you like to start, <coughs> excuse me, down your end? Nothing for me. No. <coughs> the cameras, the only thing, uh, you have 23000 for every school. Now, is this a set plan? Or I'm just curious, this is why every school you have? The estimate that we were, the work that was done to estimate for us uh, was not, uh, it, it's not a bid. It wasn't bid out. So this is something we still have to go to bid on. But we had the vendor that we have worked with in the past come in and do an analysis of all three buildings. And one building may be a little more than another building when we ultimately decide which cameras to place where. We basically took a building and said X number of cameras, X number of leads, uh, and then the backbone upgrade that needed to be done and split that across the three buildings. So this is really a, essentially a $70,000 appropriation split three ways. Because we looked at the project 
in the aggregate and said, what's it going to take to do all three buildings and upgrade them all at the same time? But you have no idea what you're going to do to each building. Not specifically this camera, that camera. What led us was, again, some of the vandalism. And the question was, I want to put a camera there, and I want to put a camera there. Okay, well, if you're going to do that and you're going to upgrade and you're going to make that digital, let's talk about everything that was suggested in your, in your threat assessment, and let's talk about upgrading in these areas as well mm -hmm. uh, to find the benefit of greater resolution, greater distance out of the digital cameras. And so we essentially came down to a given number of cameras per building that would address these needs, and that's what drove the number. So at this point, I can tell you maybe three or four cameras that – we're absolutely certain, I want to do this, I want to do this, and I want to do this. The others will have to be identified through the engineering work that we do. And this won't go to repairing any of the other ones to upgrade the technology? On We're going to keep all of the old ones. None of them have really failed. They simply don't no, provide. I'm so we're going to reposition for the, them. For the picture quality. We're, we're going to reposition them onto areas where this is the distance that we're recording as opposed to something greater so that we can still get great value out of the image that they capture. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what was the amount you still had for the parking to add on to? 80, 85. 85. 85. I think I said 95. Have. I keep bouncing back and forth. I'm pretty sure it's 85,000. Okay. Mr. Lassard's watching at home right now, and he'll <laughs> text me in a minute. He'll he say 85. Me, I didn't bring that with me. I'm sorry, but yeah, it's 85,000. Um, and how many lockers does this include as far as the Austin? We used a, a dollar amount just shy of this, I believe, and did the entire third grade. Mm -hmm. And so we intend to do essentially the fourth grade wing with this. So it's essentially fourth grade? So I'm talking about 120, 120 uh, lockers. And this should kind of clean them all up? or this it, For the fourth grade. And, and this is, they fit. Thankfully, the, the construct or the, the design is, is similar enough. They fit where the old ones were. So out they come and in they go. It doesn't take significant reconstruction of the hallways or of you know those areas. Um, this doesn't go upstairs and deal with the fifth grade nor the fifth grade classrooms that are further down that wing, but it, it should reach the fourth grade classrooms. Somebody actually designed something that would fit? Eight foot, eight <laughs> foot, ten foot, ten foot. Yeah, this, these made sense. We were really pleased. So okay. We had a lot of corrosion with the existing ones. Well, in 1975, the corrosion was is the kids go into their lockers and they put their boots in there full of sand and salt. Mm -hmm. And when we <coughs> went to review them, the corrosion was incredible. Oh. And we, we, did, we actually had complaints that wasn't appropriate for the kids. And then that causes kids to... You know, th they could easily get bruised by those those what conditions. So they need to be replaced. <laughs> what forty years old? Uh, yeah. The original, yeah. Super. Thank you. Thank you for questions. How many cameras, total? I. <laughs> yeah. That would be as many as I can, as many as we can make happen to address <laughs> the greatest needs. This is not a this is not a a replacement of our system, globally or completely. So. Um, you know, it's been long enough now since I sat in that meeting that I can't tell you the number. What I can tell you is that a significant chunk of that 70,000, maybe almost a third of it, is, is back end. It's server side technology, it's the viewing and recording uh, software that are all needed to be upgraded as we move to the digital age as, and replace the, the uh, analog stuff that we were using, again, which was, which was good and has served our needs to some great extent. Uh, I'd be I'd be happy to dial back to the proposal and come out with how many cameras. Um, this is an installed price, so it means not only uh, bringing bringing appropriate data and power connectivity to the spot, but also installing the camera. So uh, I'm trying to talking, trying to see if it comes back to me. I want to say I'm in the seven fifty to thousand dollar range as I buy and install a camera, and those were one version or one generation of cameras. There were some that were more expensive. When I talked about, for instance, putting on a pole out so I could see the playground, and you talk about whether you trench and, t and wire that where you radio the signal back and, and capture the signal that way. So there were different prices considering or determining, depending on what we do that way. Off the top, I'm not gonna be able to tell you how many, but it was, it, it was sufficient to drive the measured impact that we wanted to have in terms of seeing the playgrounds, the parking lot, and the fields 
in a way that was more useful than the current cameras allow. Okay. Jerry? Oh, I have a question. I just, I've been in all three schools, and they're really beautifully maintained. Uh, and I'm critical. I mean, I, I walk through the corridors and the bathrooms and the classrooms, and they're spotless. And I don't see any deterioration and any safety issues for our kids and security issues we're working on. That's an ongoing program. This is just a step toward it. We had a threat assessment, as uh, Nate indicated, and Kathy pulled off with uh, local police and some FBI people and so on. So we know what they have suggested, and we're taking a step at a time and getting there. But uh, this is the kind of money it takes to keep our schools uh, properly maintained and, and keeping the kids safe and, and uh, mitigating any deterioration that occurs, parking lots and the like. So I, I'm comfortable. Otherwise, I wouldn't have supported it. I, I would approve it. This Warren article in general has had a good life. Comes up every year. The money is well spent. We see it. As Jerry's saying, as we walk through the schools, we don't see any chicken little. The sky is falling. Um, as we see in some other areas that we neglect. So from its intention a very long time ago, and yes, you were you were born. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to think he was 20. <laughs> but it, it, Looking it, in C25, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> but it has been a very useful um, article, and under Keith, it has actually served us very well with the planning in it. Certainly when we talk about cameras, um, it's not something in the past we would have felt we needed, but this is a new world, and the technology is there. Keeping up with it does cost money, um, but I think it costs us even more as we see if we don't utilize things out there that we can. Uh, my only question on the cameras would be, is this a phased situation, or is this going to be complete for the time being? This is complete for complete. the time being, yeah. I mean, I think the intent was that we would we would address those areas where the resolution was really going to make a difference. I think that the next phase, if there were to be one at some point, would be to have a conversation that I think would want to be a larger one about turning cameras inward and mm -hmm. looking at stairwells and corridors and passing areas. And in this case, the, the greatest extent that we'll go in that regard is to areas like the lobby, the areas where we, we might see traffic other than just us. Mm -hmm. uh, and want to monitor that for for our historical purposes, you know, for look back. So, uh, but again, that's not that's not on the that's not in the offing. This really seeks to address the the concerns that have been identified and the very real situations that have already arisen in the last year. So, mm -hmm. and then to be clear, this is a very specific Warren article. When we started this Warren article a long time ago, some of you will remember it had an amount and a generality to it and was nonspecific as to where it would go other than <coughs> maintenance as required, basically. Um, so that is to say that these amounts of money will only be spent in these areas mm -hmm. and nowhere else. That's true. And, and, that's, I, and I think that if Mr. Lassard were here, the, I, I can hear his voice saying, well, <laughs> remember, that's why we put that ADA thing in there. <laughs> Because if, for instance, we, if we were right. to be trumped by, wow, you really need to spend 20 grand on this particular accessibility issue, it would be appropriate to have said out loud, mm -hmm. if something like that were to arise and we couldn't fund it otherwise, then we might chase that. But do we don't anticipate that, and, and these are the exact projects that we look to complete within the two-year cycle. You sure you don't have a text right now? I don't. I keep looking. <laughs> he hasn't. I know he's out there watching. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Michael? This is work well for a number of years and we should continue it. Great. Thank you. Also, thank you. Nathan, previous Sorry. slide, please. Yes. Oh, I've got an error? No. Oh, that that is you. the Warren article. Yes, it is? Yeah. Not the, not the next slide, but that slide. They are both actually the article. They both appear on article the ballot. Article three is the article. So too. the actual numbers will be on the ballot? They are on the ballot, yes, sir. All these line items? All, all those line items, items. That, yep, just as you see it. And do you consider them, uh, these line items? be binding 
Yes, as I said, you know, I think uh, you know if we had an ADA concern or something that arose, and then we talk about it very, you know, talk about it publicly with the school board so that it it gets an audience uh, in the public way. Mr. But Murphy, do you consider it binding? Audience. For example, you've got uh, uh, bathroom on Mazden School accessibility and renovation for fifty thousand. I'm very comfortable with 50, that. Fifty thousand dollars. I'm very comfortable with that. The number comes into sixty thousand dollars. Will you I, spend sixty thousand dollars? I would go to the school board and I would talk to them about what is in the operational budget to cover that amount if mm -hmm. in fact that's what we needed. Same with the ADA. At any given point in time we could have a youngster come in with significant disabilities, physical disabilities that required um, specific kinds of changes in our building. I mean it's simple as water fountains. So that's a good line so to, to look at. So that's another place where I, I heard, can't tell I you it would be exact but if I ran over five thousand dollars then we would go to the school board asking for permission to use money that was built into the operational budget under the maintenance and facilities section of our budget. It's the only place we have to go. I heard earlier that the ADA improvements, which is kind of like a, an iffy thing, right? Now, if it, if it becomes a non-thing, what will happen to that $5,000? Like all of our other money that we don't use, okay, is returned. <laughs> So it's it won't be it, it won't be put into the operating budget. It won't be no, spent on anything no. else. No, no. This is very specific. Okay. That this is how it's used, and that these monies are returned. Actually, it'll, we've done that. Haven't we? we have, and it'll yeah. it'll be returned. It'll become a part of the fund balance at the end of fiscal year sixteen seventeen, and go back to offset taxes in the fall of seventeen. The fund balance, not the operating budget fund balance, but some other fund balance. I guess. No, well, the 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 fund balance of that fiscal year. I mean, remember, okay. we, well, we all the dollars go back at the end of every year in the on the school side. Okay. We don't keep a retained earnings or a fund balance. So I see on your budget on uh, item number twenty six twenty buildings. Yes, there is a line item for repair and maintenance of something over two hundred thousand dollars. That's in addition to. This three hundred thousand more now. That's ongoing routine operational maintenance in the buildings. Yes. Right, and and uh, this this continues to beg the question to me because as you mentioned earlier, we have a three hundred thousand dollar warrant article every year for as long as anyone can remember, and it's just like a magic number, three hundred thousand dollars. Every year we manage to come up with exactly three hundred thousand dollars in needed. Stuff for well, wait. I think that's unfair because, for instance, last year we allocated ninety-five thousand, eighty-five thousand dollars for the paving, mm -hmm. and said we won't do it with eighty-five thousand. We'll wait and ask for the remaining dollar amount in the second year, and so we we used two cycles in order to afford that without impacting the taxpayers in any greater way. And no, so, no, please, please don't misunderstand me. I yeah. think. I think the leadership of SAU 90 is absolutely great, right? and I'm not challenging how you're spending your money or whether it's being abused in any way, okay? What I am concerned with is this one article keeps showing up at $300,000, like $300,000 of some magic number. You know, we talked about that because last you brought, year, yes, right? you mm -hmm. did, you brought that up last year. And so we went back to the office and we talked about it. And and so, I, I, honestly, that's been a target number for us because we felt that it was palatable. The community accepted that amount of money in a very, um, in, in a way, every single year. They anticipated it and we weren't asking for 500 one year, two the next, but it, that was a, a, a systemic way of looking at our repairs over time. And so I, uh, we did discuss that because, you know, maybe people would perceive that as, oh, every year you want 300000 300, whether you need it or not. But so w w what we decided was is because the community has had a favorable um, look at the way those monies were being spent and the projects that we spent them on, that we would continue with the three hundred and that we would work to our work our budget into that number. So it, 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 we kind of reversed it, and, and we did take what you said last year and, and discussed it, but um, mm. we, is that Keith? So, is that Mr. <laughs> chance? <laughs> so basically, you want, you're, you're targeting $300,000 for the purposes of being consistent, basically. Exactly. 
Exactly. Uh, and, 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 and no surprises, and no surprises to the community, and no fluctuations, because I think that's, what's, that's what causes people to reflect back and say, what's going on? One year it's 600, the next year it's 2, the next year it's 5. It, 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 it does cause uh, concern among um, you know the the constituents. So yeah. we joined, we have made a decision to to keep it at a at a very steady, consistent pace. So then the, the, the does um, again. This is these are informational questions. Yep. No, okay. I know, and I think I, they're good ones. Okay. Um, we have something over two hundred thousand dollars in the budget in addition to the three hundred thousand, and they're really addressing the same thing: repair and maintenance of buildings. They are, but these um, these are much larger projects. That two hundred thousand dollars reflects. Things like carpet replacement, blinds replacement, painting, um, all of the things, plumbing, electrical work that has to be done over the summer, replacement so, so of lights and so bulbs. So doesn't this one article include painting? So I mean, this is my point is that right. you know maybe we should consider Jerry uh, taking this Warren article and just subsuming it into the budget, where perhaps it belongs, since we're so consistently doing three hundred thousand every year. Let's just put it in the budget. Maybe that is a worthy consideration. Tim, I'm yes. just going to interject a little something here only because I was here a long time ago. I was born in another universe when we put this thing together. This $300,000 Warren article was, I believe, this community working at its best with every good intention. This arose out of needs that were going in the CIP report that we never funded. This was, that $300,000 figure was gathered after years of tracking to see exactly what we were spending. And it was a conservative number at that that felt could be directed and planned going forward. However, we still left the ability for the voter to take it away every election if they felt that we did not need it. So putting it back in the budget might speak more to what you're saying about giving $300,000 a line and saying here you're free to spend it however you want. By doing this, the voters every year have the opportunity to accept it or to reject it and every year you get to do some planning on the history that the voters have liked what you've done and possibly will go forward the next year and pass the budget Tony, you, you wouldn't have the visibility yeah. right. of this to, to <coughs> Eileen's point. If this is very it, specific. Well, if you put it in a budget, it gets buried in there. It's a simulated one big number. This way here, it breaks it out. It identifies it element by element by element. They look at it. They digest it. They, many of them, don't forget, there's 1,130, 40 kids in school. I mean, there's a lot of parents. They go into schools, they see what's going on, they see the schools, they see the condition of the schools. I think they have a lot of confidence in what's been happening, and hence they have historically bought into it. When you bury it in the budget, <coughs> it loses its identity. I think Eileen's got a good point about keeping it right out there and waving it. If they, they choose to not uh, vote for it, they have that option. So, uh, but the $300,000 figure, I, I was thinking about when the town had a $300,000 capital road fund every year. And every year it, it, it passed, and I think there's one in there this year as well. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a fair comparison. Okay, I don't want to compare back and forth, and gentlemen. Yeah. I'd like I to want to keep on my this time, one. if I might. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I watch every one of your meetings. several of them multiple times <laughs> and I, I'm only asking that there be some consideration about the relationship between this regular warrant article and the budget I mean the idea of having the option to the voters we could we have an item under here called furniture why is that not given the voters a chance as well I mean why isn't that a separate one we can, we could make that argument all day I don't I don't want to make that argument today okay I'm only asking that there be consideration at a subsequent meeting the following year that we have some consideration here since this is so consistently 300,000 every year maybe some or perhaps all of it should be consumed uh, uh, assumed into the budget perhaps some things that are in the budget might be 
better put into this one article. So a little further consideration is all I'm asking for. I do support this one article, just as I did last year, but I'd like to see some in your school committee meetings, some further consideration on this. That's Thank all you, I would have to say. Thank you, Bob. <coughs> I'm delighted to see the breakdown, what we're spending the mm -hmm. money on. Uh, I'm particularly happy to see the camera issue being addressed. I would mention in passing, uh, about two or three weeks ago, there was an article in the Daily New York Times business section, and a company in Western Massachusetts, after Sandy Hook, attempted to address entry to schools at the doors without spending a fortune. And they came up with a door they said they could put on a school for about $1,000 per door. And it didn't prevent the entry, but what it did is it bought five or six minutes, which allowed time for the police to arrive. And uh, I don't know if that's of any interest to you. I just mentioned it in passing. As to this, to me, this is just like budgeting a need you have now. And if you don't budget in some way now, you have twice as much need next year, and you're not going to get $600,000 to meet that need. Uh, so I just don't see politically a more practical or effective way to do it than the way you are now doing it. Thank you, Bob. Glenn? Um, yes, I have no problem with the Warren article, except in general, it's that old debate between in the budget or in a Warren article, and especially if there's building repairs in the budget. I think the it's you know, been the story. <laughs> So I, I would echo Tim's comments about maybe some I, I like consideration. This, I like this way to do it because it protects those projects. Those projects get done. We made a commitment to the community that we were going to do, you know, uh, upgrade perimeter security. And <coughs> we said we were going to do that, and it's out there. Rather than get in the budget where it, it can get, as you know in budgets, can get a little gray in terms of, well, this went over a little bit, I'm going to use a little bit of that money. I like this. I, I, I like the parameters that it gives us, the transparency that it gives to the community. So, but, but I hear, we, we, we hear you. Ideally, I would we like hear to see you. information like this in, the, in the, the budget so it wouldn't be, yeah. you know, turn into a gray area or whatever. Um, um, but the the budget town has never had a problem passing the school budget. Right. Oh, I know. And I don't think that this would fail if it were incorporated into the regular operating <sighs> I think that people would be just as enthusiastic about it if they were listed individually in the operating budget. That's it. All set. All set. Uh, I've, I've been through this uh, battle discussion many years. And I agree with the philosophy that if you have it over here, it should not be over there. So one could argue <coughs> double dipping, but on this particular point, it's been a lost cause. I have never been able to convince anybody that there's not the way to do it, so I give up. <laughs> Note it. Note that. <laughs> Did he give it up? <laughs> I gave up a long time ago. Don't, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> Is that your final word, Mike? Gonna raise your awesome. hands now. All right, Slack and Waddell, <laughs> Jim. I, I just think that um, it's important that it's here because the, these are the things, and I don't mean to call them little things because they, they do add up. But if if these items start getting pushed off, it's when you see a deterioration of the district and, and of the assets, and and by committing them to paper and committing them here. They're going to get done, and the assets are going to be protected. And and as was stated earlier, if it's in the budget, there's that ability to move that number around a little mm -hmm. bit. And mm -hmm. you put off painting the soffits, and you put That's off, right. and you say, "We'll get up to it next year." And before you know it, rot has set in, and now you've got a bigger bill. <laughs> I, I think this puts it right out there to the taxpayer that this is what we're doing to the assets, we're maintaining them. Jerry alluded earlier that 
how good the schools look, and this is one of the reasons, because they're taking care of it on an ongoing basis. So I think it's a good idea to be right where it is. But could I just, not, not directly on this, but on your threat assessment, did they give a recommendation about cameras being inside? Uh, no, they really didn't. They it didn't. was mostly the perimeter cameras. Okay. Um, we do have some in when when you come into any of our buildings. There's there's cameras mm -hmm. there, and in in the office they have a cam a, a TV set, right. so they know who's coming and going in the buildings. And there's only one entry into all all of your but buildings. But not in hallways. But not in right. hallways and stairwells. So you can a movement, uh, right. We are a K eight, and uh, mm -hmm. perhaps you'll see more of that at a, at a, at the secondary level, the high school level. Um, we'll be looking at that as we look forward to some renovations at Hampton Academy, but right now we don't have that. It's four years. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Rich, I know you're chomping at the bit over there. Uh, just, just a comment on this. You know, I think having an article like this where everything is spelled out uh, avoids that age-old uh, problem that we've had of saying, well, you know, if we did something three years ago, it wouldn't cost us $600,000 this year. You know, here's the situation here where Keith Lasada is doing a heck of a job in timelining these things that he feels are necessary so that we don't get hit with a $900,000 bill two years from now. Yeah. This takes it in stages, keeps things current, and keeps everything like you say, Jerry. Yeah, you can see the, the results. That, that's what I'm saying. Instead of putting it off and putting it off, and then, well, you know, we should have done that three years ago. This is an opportunity. It is the transparency of what is going to be done, and it's very visible. And like Jerry says, if you go down to school, you can see the efforts that have been put in over the past years because they know that, hey, you know, we got a good shot at getting these things done because the voters are in favor of us keeping up the, uh, the, the infrastructure of these buildings. That's, that's just my feeling on it. Yeah. And with those cameras, they'll be able to see you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Tim has his hand up one final time, and then I'm going to put this to a vote. I wanted to, be, I wanted to be clear that I am not advocating that we ought not to spend the money for these things. I am only asking that um, the school committee and the administration give more consideration on camera, as they do on so many other things, which educate me on a lot of things, require me to have almost no questions when you come here, because I've already been informed. And I have this question, you know, I mean, are we given proper, you know, deep consideration as to what's going into the budget, what's going into the Warren article? I'm not seeing that yet. I know you guys have been busy with other things, but I'd like to see it. It's an expression of what I'd like to see, okay? But I am in favor of this. I made a note no doubt too. about it. Okay. okay. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you all. I have a motion to recommend this one article. Yeah, I, I'll make that motion. Second. Anyway. Okay. Or are you making the motion, or would you like? No, I don't make that. <laughs> I'll make a motion uh, that we uh, we approve the article three, long term maintenance, as written. As written, uh, three hundred thousand uh, dollars, and has broken down by Hampton Academy fifty. Marston School, 218, and Center School, 32, for a total of $300,000. Sorry. Can I just ask you to change um, approve to recommend? We're recommend. recommending the Warren recommend. Articles. We're not approving them. I recommend. We're recommending them to the Okay, thank you. Right. And that would be on all of them, yeah. gentlemen. All right, all those in favor of recommending? Unanimous. Who seconded that? I did. Jim Jones did. <laughs> Moving on to number four. Article number four is, uh, I guess I would characterize it as the beginning of our attempt to actively address facility concerns at Hampton Academy on a, on a greater scale. The article asks that the school district will appropriate the sum of $86,250 for the purpose of securing owner's project management and architectural support so that we can complete preliminary engineering and establish project concept and scope for a renovation project. There's been a lot of work done contemplating the state of the building at Hampton Academy. There's been educational specification designed more, more than once in the past. Uh, there have been a number of studies and surveys done about the programmatic needs and deficiencies of the space, as well as the safety 
accessibility, uh, et cetera, deficiencies, code deficiencies, if you will, of the space. And so we've talked about doing a project, but have identified that between the superintendent and myself and Mr. Lassard, there are three very important jobs that we hope are getting done well, and there was sufficient capacity for us to tackle the project that we did at Center School, but this is a different scope. And so rather than getting too far into the project and determining that we missed things that we could have and should have done, it has been recommended and we have seen evidence in other districts of success with an owner's project management approach. And so <coughs> we seek to find an owner's project manager to work with us to help establish the primary goals and objectives of that project to work up an RFQ and go through the process of finding an architectural partner, to lead then the facilities committee and the architect in determining what the scope of the project would be, and then to help us complete sufficient preliminary engineering so we can come up with not biddable documents, but a project <coughs> plan, renderings, estimate of cost, so that we can have a conversation with the community about what that project would look like and what the ramifications are. Log logistics, have the conversation about how space would be dealt with in terms of the footprint of the facility and the impact on other departments, other uh, divisions of town government. Uh, you know, we had but uh, the fire station there, uh, Hampton Academy and Winnicott Road, the library is right next door. There are any number of additional needs that may need to be addressed or may want to be addressed at the same time or addressed in any part possible uh, at that time in the community. So this is a this is a very first step and candidly a bit of a litmus test I think in terms of a conversation that's been uh, long had in the community and so we put an RFQ on the street uh, the results were um, delivered to us yesterday we have some strong interest from a couple of firms uh, in the region that have experience in this regard joining us as an owner's project manager. The dollar amount of $86,250 is arrived at without us yet evaluating the fee proposals because we're trying to do a qualitative assessment of those RFQs before we look at their, their price tags, if you will, their cost estimates. But we're looking at approximately a 15-month commitment at roughly 30, 30 hours a month at what we estimate to be $125 bill per hour. That's $56,250, and it may be more or less than that, depending on the services that we ask for uh, and what we find in this RFQ. But our comps, uh, comparables and estimates that we've worked up talking to districts in the region is that what the architects and engineering firms used to do for nothing, which we hope we can still secure for nothing, but what they used to do for nothing in terms of specularly putting together these renderings and helping you get yourself to project approval, they're more often than not charging for those services today, uh, especially in the absence of building aid. Uh, uh, there, have been so, there have been so many of them that have put forth effort that has gone nowhere in the last handful of years. So this is, uh, this is that, that request. The timeline right now is very much dependent upon the work that we do with that Orange Project Manager and the Facilities Committee. It reasonably uh, it suggests that we would be back looking for funding at the 2016 vote for either the architectural and engineering work that would be needed to get biddable documents that we could go to bid with so that we would have a vote on a project in the subsequent year, or depending on the approach that's taken, it could be a request for a full project. But that's completely based upon the work that still needs to be done. So. We have double-checked. There is, uh, uh, by last count, somewhere in excess of $130,000 assigned to SAU 90 and the Hampton School District and the impact fees, and we would seek re withdrawal from impact fees to help fund that. You don't see that in your revenues tonight because until such time as that happens, it does have a tax impact as it hits the ballot, uh, but we anticipate that that would be offset by impact fees and not really have an impact on the taxpayer. Article 4. Okay. I'm going to start over here on this side. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, has a study like this ever been done in that school before that we could go back and see if what was proposed in the past and what we've done to correct the problem? 
a number of the code deficiencies have been addressed. We continue to talk about with our 300,000 others. We've got sprinklers in the building now in all but the sixth grade wing. Um, and so we have continued to take steps to address some of those. Programmatically, uh, we need to reassess some of the program uh, expectations that previous studies were based upon because our anticipated future for Hampton Academy would be at least some what measurably different than it was a decade ago uh, when previous studies or previous inspects have been done. But the majority of the assessment that has been done was about what's wrong with the building and what needs to be fixed. We can tick off what's been fixed. Beyond that, um, this would be not an assessment of what's needed necessarily, but of based upon all of the assessments of what we need to do, what would we like to do? What would be the right thing to do? And part of that is, like I said, talking about how to fit it on that footprint. I didn't say it should have prefaced maybe the last time this conversation was had, I say the last time, when we first arrived three and a half, four, almost four years ago, the conversation then was, should we renovate in place on Hampton Academy or should we take advantage of the property the district owns on Toll Farm Road and build new? And the board set that conversation aside based upon public hearings and public forums and agreed that it was important that we renovate in place that that seemed to be the community's desire. So this is the next step in that. Well, if, if the town continues to own the building, those renovations would have to be done regardless of who was the occupant of the building. Eventually, you're right, yeah. Um, my last question was the engineering firm that we're going to request this information from. Once they make the recommendation, where does their role end? Is it just to prepare this? Or would they be the people who would actually do the work if we were chosen to move forward? So our intent in, our, in choosing an OPM, an owner's project manager, is that that firm, and that's what our RFQ requested, is that they would guide us through the process of scope and, uh, and move us towards approval of the public eye, but also would serve in the clerk of the works kind of role and would carry us all through the way with construction administration. So we're looking for a firm that could provide us the service through all of that. We're really looking for folks that, somebody that could help us in managing public conversation. Um, I think in this case you might find that the owner's project manager might answer questions in some regard where architects often have answered with regard to our plan and our desire. Um, I don't know that to be true, and I think it depends on who we end up with as an owner's project manager and who we, as a result, end up with as an architect and engineer. I just asked the question because if this person, if this company is the company that's going to receive the work, they might recommend that we do things that aren't necessarily okay, right. no. necessary. Necessary. Mm -hmm. yep. Just great, great, great point. The, the history that we have experienced in my discussions with uh, other superintendents who have used their projects, very large projects, I might add, um, using an owner's project manager, um, that owner's project manager represent the interests of their school district, and in fact, they were the ones that, along with the administration, went and 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 uh, worked with the engineer, architects, construction people to ensure that the district was not getting um, uh, uh, sub quality as well as. Uh, paying for product that w far exceeded what the average was. So they were bulldogs. To, that was the word that one of the superintendents used to me. Um, a school board member from that same town um, introduced this owner's project rep as the guy that saved the district X amount of dollars because of the, his, his work. Now the folks that we looked at were, were reviewing their uh, statements of qualifications now. Um, and uh, the, the projects they have done are very much in line with the projects that, that, that we want to do. So um, we think it will be a good fit. Any more questions? Thank you. Oh, no question. Brian? <coughs> I have, I guess I have a problem. Securing owners, project management, and architectural support to companies' preliminary engineering So we're going to start something, so we're looking at probably, what, 2020 before we can do anything? Because we're going to start something from the beginning? What? So Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I, how I would answer it, I think that um, mm. I anticipate right now from our conversations there's two, two paths, two timelines that are likely. Both start with finding a partner 
who helps us to then make good good decisions about an architectural partner and the scope of the project and the approach to the project. We then end up either asking for the A and E money to do the blueprints next year and ask for the project in the subsequent year, seventeen, and break ground, or we ask for the whole project in the subsequent year and then have to go to work with the architect and engineer putting the blueprints together and going out to bid, so we probably don't break ground until seventeen. So this approach suggests one that we get a partner, two, we alert the public that we're talking about doing this for real and get some sense from this article, for instance, whether there's support for that notion or not. Either way, I think we'd be talking about breaking ground, hopefully, in 2017 on a project that we would hope, I think, we, to complete in two years or less so that we could be into it in the fall of 19. Well, we'd be into it the whole time anyway. <laughs> but You've got a lot of hope. Um, <laughs> how much would, I mean, have you looked into the fact of trying to do everything? So when we arrived, the, the, the engineering, f the architectural firm that the district had been working with <coughs> handed us proposals that had been considered in the year before, or in that year that we arrived, that put the price tag of a renovation and or the price tag of a new construction out at Old Town Farm Road in the, in the same range, 26 to $28 million. I think we believe, if that's I mean, <coughs> what you're asking, I mean, that's, that was to do what at the time had been assessed as needed to be done. In the meantime, there have been some things done at the building that would not need to be done. Uh, I think that included in that proposal or in those expectations, there were things that might not need to be done anyway. Uh, I think that we would guide us to, to be a little more frugal maybe than that uh, architectural firm might have led, have led us to be. And so we even in our first blush said, wow, let us chip away at that just a little bit. We don't want to do without things that we need. We also don't want to do anything more than what we must um, reasonably. Um, there has, by the way, there has though been, you know, a, a passage of time and potentially some increase in cost. But again, that's part of what this is all about, is making sure we know what that scope is and we come up with reasonable estimates so that we know and can communicate with the public what exactly the, scope, the project would look like. Now, with this firm, whoever it is, would this be strictly for this project or are you looking for someone to look at, say, no, nope. other two schools. Just Hampton Academy, and and I think I I may be I may be wrapping my head around your question a second ago better. This is not the engineering firm or the architectural firm that would be doing the blueprints. This is not the general contractor or the builder who would be coming and doing the project. This is essentially an extension of Kathleen and Keith and myself, where we can't be all things to all people and don't have as much background and expertise as this firm would to represent us and be our. I saw in this I saw on the website of one of the firms that I was sleuthing trying to come up with a, a list to send the RFQ to we they would be our conscience I think was the phrase they used in in helping to to, to guide and oversee the project so this so is strictly a project strictly manager for Hampton, yeah. this is strictly a project manager to work and with us and the rest of it is going to cost right this is first time yep thank you Richard, I'm not clear on this withdrawal of impact fees. Yep. Can you explain that to me, please? Well, having identified what the costs would be, right. we would we would seek to fund this with impact fees. There's about $130,000 out there now. School impact fees. School impact fees already received, already collected in the account as of the end of the de end of December. I don't know that this is going to pass, so it's not a request that's been made. They haven't estimated the revenues as a known revenue, uh, but we've been pulling in past years uh, from the impact fees to offset the ongoing debt service that that uh, is, is an element that's defined under the ordinance. And in this case, we hope that this would be something that we could use impact fees to fund. So you're saying the withdrawal from an impact fee account, account. Yes, sir. account yep. to pay for, all right. Yep, if that makes more sense. That makes Thank more you. sense to Please. me. Okay, <laughs> yes, from the account. Because when I look at that, it looked like uh, SAU 29, uh, SAU 90 is being charged an impact fee and we're no, no, paying no. a, no. You know, we're from the account. We're, we're, we're charging ourselves for. <laughs> from the account of already collected from dollars. impact fee account. Yes, all right, that clears Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. 
Jay? No, I, I don't have any comments. Okay. I, I, I support it. So to go further on that impact fee, as you know, some impact fees are collected. We do not collect for the municipal end, but we do collect for the schools. And it has gone to many projects and does accumulate to a fairly decent amount of money. It would be nice to see that, that the impact fees go to this. So that 86000 um, in this Warren article <coughs> can be consumed by the impact fees. If it can't, yeah, yes it can. I, I don't have a I don't have an opinion yet on what the ordinance says and if this which is preliminary to the project is is uh, an appropriate use but if it's not then we could continue to draw down on the impact fees as we have in the past and use it as an offset you know what I mean I mm. who and who is going to determine if it is an appropriate use well I guess I would I would lay that at the feet of the Selectmen who have to honor the request and the guidance that they would get from their their council I mean because ultimately that's who we make the request of the school board requests mm -hmm. from the school board and uh, from the town and ultimately <coughs> the selectmen through the planning board is would that be correct Fred the no. guidance on that no so it would just be the selectmen it'll be the selectmen and the interpretation of the ordinance okay now, is that something that we can have interpreted before we go to the polls on this one? And before we go to um, deliberative session? Because I think it's a, it changes it a lot. We might have some people that may not be too fond of canting up for another $86,000, but if they knew it was coming out of the impact fees, that could be a game changer on this one, and I think very important. Yeah, anyway, I have the words no tax impact at the bottom. Exactly. We'd have to ask. Or um, perhaps at the very least, if, and I, I'm just suggesting this out there, the wording of appropriate the sum of 86250 could that be changed to up to? That's a question I'm asking. It's not a... I think the wording in the article is up to the school board. Okay. Than their council, so I can't really answer that question. The school statutes are different than the town statutes, so they, their council would have to look at those statutes and determine whether or not you could reword that article in that fashion. I would, I would make, I would offer the suggestion that if you look at Article One, the operating budget, there was when I arrived, and, and always has been, I guess, a note that is essentially a parenthetical. No, Warren Article 1, the operating budget does not include appropriations in any other Warren Articles. Mm -hmm. That's not statutory in nature. It's not on articles in every district around the state, but it's something homegrown and it's meaningful to this community. By the same token, and I know that the DRA doesn't love parentheticals, but by the same token, I think you could, under Article Number 4, make a parenthetical note that this will not have tax impact. It's intended to be offset by impact fees or what have you, if we had ascertained that that was, in fact, Right. True. You could put a parenthetical in there. I know the DRA will want us to have a sum certain in the article, so the up to is more that's more tenuous for them. They want there to okay. be a certain number. That's why I we say the sum of. But, but it, we, I, we can chase that for the deliberative for sure. Okay. I, I just think <coughs> it would serve the public well to know whether or not the impact fees could, could be used in this particular situation before they vote on it, not after. So I'll just throw that out there as maybe some work that could be done between now and when everything is finalized. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Michael. I don't have any questions. Also, thanks. Madam Chair, two excellent points. Thank you for those. I think uh, the phrase up to is always good. Uh, I encourage you to include it. I don't see any reason why you couldn't uh, include those two words. Um, we got any tax impact and getting an advanced uh, opinion from the Board of Selectmen I think uh, is excellent and it would enable you to put no tax impact on here I believe so I think those are excellent points Madam Chair and I'm wondering if we as a budget committee should not make a recommendation to the Board of Selectmen that they consider this forthwith so that the voters know um, what kind of impact if any 
We can request that basic. they can consider. Yes, but we that's can make exactly what I'm thinking about. Yeah. A request, not a recommendation. And I'd be happy to do that. When you're ready to entertain the motion, I'll be happy to make it. Or second it, as you prefer. I don't think we need a motion. I mean, we have a selectman's representative sitting here, and I have every confidence in Mr. Wardell that he can convey this back. I'll leave the procedural aspects to you, Madam Chair. Thank and you That's very all much. I have to say. And I appreciate that. Bob. Uh, my concern would be, can you live in the house that you're going to completely renovate? Uh, how, what kind of impact does this have on the children if you're doing a $26 million project while they're in the classroom? And my, the second part of my question would be, would the town sell the land in West Hampton if this project were approved to help pay for this project? Um, I, I'm going to try to answer those questions. Um, we have talked about that. What What's the conditions uh, in which uh, students would be under given a renovation project? Um, having experienced the renovation project at Nash Nashua South High School, when in fact half the building was students, half the students, the other half were over at Nashua North, and then the building was under s significant renovation. And when I mean significant, I mean the whole internal was gutted. Um, we feel that some of those same concepts can happen at Hampton Academy. We do feel that we will need additional space. Um, we are already looking at the space uh, potential at Marston School in that um, w would we be able to handle a team at Marston um, by some changes in classrooms. And so we're looking at that. We would very much like to be able to do that. So during periods of the construction, we may um, have to move youngsters out of uh, Hampton Academy as a team over to another school during that time. So we, we do know that that will happen. Depending on what the final outcome is and what the building looks like, and do you build a, a section new, uh, you complete that in in a, in a phase stage, and so that 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 portion of the building is open, and the students move to that while you renovate the other half. Um, those are the kinds of considerations that we would like to make um, as we go down this road. But we don't know that yet until um, we really to begin to solidify what it is that that building is going to look like and what. We know what the conditions are of the building, but we, we, we also need to know what impact that will make when we, when we renovate those, those areas. So it, it's, uh, we, we, don't, we want to keep the kids together, the teams especially, um, and that age group, and we feel we can do that in existing facilities. I think we can all agree construction never goes as we anticipate it will. I agree. Well. <laughs> I agree. Okay. And can someone answer the question about what happens to the land in West Hampton? If the well, my understanding is the land um, on Toll Farm Road is dedicated to the school and to the school projects. So whether the school district can sell that, um, I, I think, will be up to a legal uh, review and whether that's written up that way. But my understanding was when we came that that, that land was devoted to uh, and given to the school for the pr purpose of um, a, a building. So uh, to just take that land and sell it uh, to help with the costs, um, my understanding, that could not happen. Thank you, Bob. Can we stay on? We've got a long night here and a lot of people, and certainly some of these things play as a factor in the future. But right now, if we could stay on the Warren articles themselves. Get anything else on the war this Warren article no. in particular? Thank you, Glenn. No questions. I have two, <clears throat> Madam Chairman. If you would, my first question is: Is there any funding available from the feds or the state? And my second point is, or question is, the impact fee comes to the school whether you use it for this or something else, like the, within the confines of that ordinance. So, using saying that it's going to be paid for with impact fees on a particular Warren article is I think a little misleading to the public. Okay. Uh, two, two things. Uh, one, we, we are um, not, right now the state is not in a position to um, uh, fund uh, building aid. Uh, it is still at a moratorium. Um, I believe that given the budget situations at the state, uh, we're not going to see a change in that. Even with that, however, 
and even if they do have some money available, because of the new criteria and the way that you have to apply and, and you have points for certain conditions, um, uh, the likelihood of Hampton being high on that list um, would not be probable for us. I don't see Building 8, and I've talked to Senator Stiles about this and other legislators. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't try. There is some money available, um, so, and should they open it up, um, we have taken the position that we're going to apply anywhere. Because should there be some small portion of some money that somebody else doesn't want, we want to be in a position where we can still go after it. Mm. High hopes, maybe. Dreams, I think somebody used that word tonight. Perhaps. But um, both Nathan and I feel, and, and given that we can um, navigate the, the Department of Ed and the folks there, that we feel that we, we should at least put our names on the list and see what the potential is. Um, federally, there are, is no money for the infrastructure of schools, but there are some bonds out there, zone bonds they call them, that have that I've received some recent information on. So we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Um, it really uh, falls on to qualifications and whether the district meets those qualifications. So we're, we're kind of keeping an eye on that. Um, you're right, impact fees are available to the school district. We have used them as we've um, <coughs> made changes at center school, um, as we've paid off our, our debt, as Nathan referred to. Um, so you're right, we, we do get that, th those impact fees. Mm -hmm. And they do become part of our revenue s stream, if you will. Um, but we're asking the community this year to devote, if, if it's approved by the, by the Board of Selectmen, that the, those funds be devoted to this particular project. And I say that because this project has been on the lips of this community for a long time. Now, I could say that it is as long as uh, when I was born, but I don't dare go that way today because <laughs> I'll hear about it. But, but you know what I'm saying, Michael. It's been a discussion. I have four or five um, different studies on my, my desk um, that have been done, and the, the town has spent a lot of money on that. It's now time to really get serious about it. Um, the building needs to have some work done in it. And I think you know that, but um, so that's where we kind of stand on okay. that. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree that you guys do a great job with the schools you have, and, and it's super. And I, I love old things, being one myself. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, you, you need to do something. I know. You need to move ahead. Right. I mean, you absolutely need to move ahead. And I think the OM, the OPM, is a great idea, and I'm sure you'll vet the firms that you hire, and I'm sure it'll give it away. And I just hope we continue with this and can go through with it rather than doing another study. I, I, I years we have promised. Saying, well, we did another study. We <laughs> promised the school board no more studies because, to me, we know what the answers are. I walk those hallways every, every day. I'm in those buildings. I see the stairwells, the the the, the narrowness. I see the issues that are, are facing the technology. You have to understand, we're, our kids are they're different. They're, they're they're wired differently. They need to have that access in terms of instruction and learning and. Um, we need to make those changes uh, to be competitive. Um, I continue to, you heard me, and I don't mean to get off track, um, Chairman, but uh, you've heard me talk about the competitiveness of our students and how they perform. And one of the factors that's very clear in research, very, very clear in research, learning environments count. Fresh air, uh, light. All of the things that are important to uh, the environment when, when students are in, in a learning situation. And so we want to bring our um, middle school up to those conditions. Mm -hmm. I think you're right, uh, Jim. Jim? All set. Thank you. Okay. Um, do I have a recommendation here? Yes. Recommend this to deliver this, Jerry? Well, I mean, how do we handle this, uh, the school impact fee on something like this? I mean, I could recommend this article, but, uh, you know, if we could have a paragraph that indicated that the uh, school impact fees will uh, accommodate. I don't think that's for us to do here. I think right now for budget committee, we <coughs> either choose to recommend it. It won't change whether we're recommending the article. It'll just change how possibly it's funded okay. and we can't do any of that work until the Board of Selectmen take it on and hopefully um, through Selectman Wardell they'll do it in a timely manner that will have impact on the impact fee um, and 
its use in this article. So, so with that in mind, I'll recommend Article 4. Uh, make a motion to recommend? I'll make a, a motion to recommend uh, the Article 4 of 86,250. The owner's project manager for the very first step toward the uh, project that's been discussed here this evening. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? The school committee still has an opportunity to change the wording on this, so I oh, encourage you to, to do that. You're and, and, right. Yeah. That's, well, yeah, this that's not, not impossible. We, we right. certainly right. have experience that way. Okay. All right. Other. Moving on to five. <coughs> Again, gentlemen, I'm going to say we have a lot of people here tonight, a lot of war and articles in front of us. If we could pick up the pace just a little bit. Article five is by petition, citizen petition that ha that came from uh, Sacred Heart School. It's a child benefit services article. The language is there provided for you. The dollar amount forty six thousand seven hundred fifty dollars uh, for everyone on the committee in the budget book that we provided you. The last page of material under the info tab includes RSA one eighty nine stroke forty nine, the the enabling law that um, that empowers this. A petition each year. I know that the principal of Sacred Heart is here with us tonight. If you had questions, last year it was forty-two thousand five hundred. This year, forty-six thousand seven fifty. If we could have the principal come up and speak to us. That's it. Yeah. Hi. Good evening. And I invite you to introduce yourself. Yes, my to name this is group. Teresa Morn Bailey, and uh, I thank you for your past support with the CBS funding for the Hampton students that attend Sacred Heart School. Um, presently we have 49 Hampton students at Sacred Heart School. Um, last year there were 42. So uh, this year uh, we are asking for 46,750. It reflects a 5.71 decrease per student from last year but it does have an overall increase of 10 percent um, due to the increased number of students that we we have um, from Hampton. So this is an average cost per student of nine hundred fifty four dollars and eight cents. Uh, now the average cost of students that attend the Hampton School District is seven is thirteen thousand seven hundred four dollars and sixty seven cents. Um, if the 49 students that we have presently at Sacred Heart were to attend uh, the Hampton schools, it would cost the district $671,528.83. We use the um, funds for, uh, to pay part of our, our nurse salary. Uh, we have a full-time nurse. Uh, we use it for health supplies, educational technology, testing services, PE supplies, and instructional materials and textbooks. None of the CBS funds are used for religious purposes. The uh, purchase orders that uh, are provided uh, directly to the Hampton School District, so they certainly know what the funds are being used for. And uh, that's what I have to offer if there's any other questions. Thank you. I'm going to start on this set. I'm all set, thank you. I'm all set. I'm all set. Um, just one question. Um, I know there's been some questions in the past about um, other school districts doing a similar kind of petition. Can you explain whether uh, students from Seabrook who attend Sacred Heart mm -hmm. The, the citizens, taxpayers of Seabrook are contributing at all? We receive CBS funds from Seabrook as okay. well. We do. Okay. Just wanted to know if Hampton was, because there was a time, I thought. There was a time we were alone. And we were alone, and I just didn't think that that was fair. Matter of fact, we requested at that point in time from Sacred Heart that they look to other towns mm -hmm. as they had looked to us for support. Yes. And so they, no they did. Alone. We're no longer alone. We're no longer Great. alone. Thank you. Exactly. No questions. 49 students from Hampton, up from 42 last year. Yes. Nathan, how many are homeschooled in Hampton? Are we 20 right now? We have a count of 20. Is that up or down from last year? Leveled. 
same yeah. level from last year. And they continue to seek no funds for a separate warrant article. Um, I support this because I support school choice, just as I support homeschooling as a choice. I support other school systems that are viable as a separate choice. So I support this warrant article. I have nothing further to say, Madam Chair. I just need to clarify a point, sure. though, if mm -hmm. I could. Um, homeschoolers still have advantages that if should uh, a homeschooler wish to take a Spanish at our middle school mm -hmm. or the STEM program, they can uh, come to us and yeah. ask, and they um, we we enroll them. Right. Uh, they're also avail They also are eligible for our after school programs and mm -hmm. athletics. So they do. They can, if they wish, their choice um, take advantage of um, offerings in our public schools, and and rightly so, they are yeah. taxpayers. And those advantages that you just delineated are also available to those who attend Sacred Heart. It's similar programs are not available there, correct? That is not correct. Oh. Um, Sacred Heart is a parochial school and therefore is not eligible. Um, so no, I mean, students Hampton's, are Hampton students are, 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 are barred from Hampton schools if they attend Sacred Heart? Well, they're not, if they're not, available, they're not available to, the, to, uh, to them at Hampton Academy. So they're, they're barred from it if they take Sacred Heart. They made a choice to attend a parochial school. Well, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm right. just right. getting clarity on right. it. The Hampton School. Right. Home schools are not, but those who choose Sacred Heart are It has to do with prohibited. Their religious affiliation. Interesting. Thank you for that uh, clarification. How many students come from Exeter? Um, I believe there's approximately 25. I seem to remember last year um, in the discussion of, you know, should some of these other towns have warrant articles, and did you approach them? And We are moving forward with that. Okay, yes. because I know that there was some discussion last year, so that's, they're still on your radar. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Questions? Thank you. When you say you're moving forward with that, is there going to be a request from them this year? Not for this year. We, we aren't able to at this time, but uh, hopefully next year. We okay. have a small committee working on, on, on this with other towns. Okay. Thank you. And Nathan, I have a question for you. Just one thing I want to clear. <coughs> with our current enrollment in our schools and with the current budget, even the proposed budget, any absorption of these students what would it cost us in addition to what we're already expending? Without breaking down exactly what the membership would be at each grade level, it's hard to answer the question, you know, with, with clarity. But I guess I would say uh, incremental cost of one student or two students or three students at any particular grade level would be negligible. It would be consumption as opposed to overhead because <coughs> teachers are in place, classrooms are established, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, I think we've talked about it in years past. There was a, I know that there was a time when this article was even more compelling, maybe for Hampton residents because the schools were at capacity and we didn't have space nor really opportunity to bring as many students back in as might have been there. Today, as long as the say 49 students weren't isolated at a particular grade level, we probably would have modest impact if they were all to come back. Uh, hard for me to put a dollar on it because again it depends on the membership but okay. obviously I you know we could we could pick up we could pick up a handful here and there and everywhere and, and it really would not increase class size significantly nor cost. All right thank you. Jerry? I have no comment. I know the community has supported this I, for years uh, and it's per the RSA it's uh, I think Mr. Preston pushed to have this installed at one time. And the community's always supported it. I support it. Uh, that's all I have to say. Now, you said that the average cost per student for Hampton taxpayers is $954. Right. Right. And we also mentioned that there are, what, 25 students coming in from Exeter, and they are not contributing through their tax base for these students. That's correct. But does the tuition cover the expense? To, to a degree, yes. I mean, the, the tuition does cover. Um, well, well what I'm, I guess what I'm driving at is if we've got 25 people coming in from Exeter, somebody should be paying the tab, whether it's the 
uh, the parents who choose to send us the children to parochial school or the taxpayers of, ha of Exeter mm -hmm. and us not bearing that burden. Right. Well, the, the um, parents are paying the tab for them, as you put it. But uh, as I mentioned, you know, we are, we are trying to move forward with looking into uh, having Exeter be a part of um, providing some CBS funds. But right now, the students coming from Exeter are not paying, or the, the town of Exeter is not supporting those students coming into? That's correct. But you're pushing for it, all right? One right. at a time. We got Seabrook. Brian? So, how are we offsetting the co how are you offsetting the cost of those people from Exeter, children? Well, it's through the operational budget. You know, we're offsetting the, the cost. So your operating budget just with Hampton, how many towns are actually contributing? For the CBS funds? Yes. Two, Seabrook and Hampton. And how many towns are sending children there? I think we have approximately 18. So two towns are paying for 18. <coughs> That's correct. Yeah, I think it was 18. Yeah. What's the total enrollment? We have uh, 182 students right now. 182. And 49 are from Hampton. That's correct. And the rest come from 16 other towns. Right. Is there any federal money? Is there anything, I mean, from churches or? Well, sure. The diocese uh, provides some funding to us. How much do they contribute? Um, offhand, I can't tell you. Thank you. Yeah. Sonny? I have a basic position on this. You know, I don't believe taxpayer money should be used for private schools. So I'm opposed to it. Deb? Um, yeah, may provide. I totally support the fact that you're being supported by Hampton, but I would add on to what was previously said about getting the other schools. Because I know last year, Someone in this room asked about Exeter, and at that time we were told we're going to look into it. I think it would mm. behoove you to go back and say to people that, you know, because I see Catholic churches and districts consolidating, so I, I think your number of students from other towns is going to increase. So I think it's important that we define something that says on a go-forward basis, I don't know how to do it. But I, I strongly urge that you recommend that we do contact Exeter and see if they will pay the share. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Okay. All right. Do I have a recommendation here? I would, I, I would recommend, article, recommend? Uh, I recommend Article 5, Child Benefit Services for the Sacred Heart School. Second. To the sum of 46750 for 2015. All right. All those in favor? <coughs> Moving it to the ballot. Opposed? Just a minute. Sonny. Uh, Sonny, Brian, and Glenn. Any abstentions? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, you have other people in the room. The Thank rest you. of the materials that are here are mm -hmm. reference. Uh, the tax, tax impacts estimated are there per item. The biggest one was the budget, which we told you last mm -hmm. time was roughly 59, 16 cents estimated as current. Mm -hmm. tax base. Otherwise, public hearing is, we're with you at Hampton Academy on the 14th. Yes, you are. Seven. And then the deliberative session for those listening at home is February 3rd at 7 o'clock again at Hampton Academy. So You're doing my job. Thank you. Unless you, have other, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, unless you have other questions, we'll get out of your way. No, thank you very much. And as usual, you've brought us a wealth of information um, for the taxpayers to be able to decide. <clears throat> Great. Superintendent Murphy, thank you again yeah. for joining us. Highly welcome. I'm going to suggest 13. that we take a strict 10-minute right. break. Channel and can I update on I'm Channel sorry? 13? Thank you, Glenn. 
We are live so and we are programming no, on Channel live. 13. Oh, they are live? So, I saw that. Just so you, just so you know, um, I, actually, I actually watched it this morning. So Thank you. It's going to take it's a strict 10-minute right. break. Yeah. All right, and reorganize yeah. some of what we have. Oh, that's going on from yeah. the time.
tabs that fund and keeps track of it is, is something that she does from the county standpoint. But the fund is the land acquisition fund, conservation land acquisition. Well, I guess you read the Warren article that was passed. So you can tell me the year for that so I can reference it? Well, they've been consistent. I mean, we do this every few years. Yeah, I, 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 I know. I don't have it in front of me. No, uh, I have to go do the research. But you did look it up. I don't have to look it up. I know. Oh, so you're telling me it is. All right. Well, according to the RSAs, the Conservation Commission is, in, is entitled to, under authorization by the town legislature, that is to say town meeting, to create a, quote, conservation fund. And those are in capital letters. Well, so it's not to be called something else. The conservation else. fund and the land acquisition fund are two different things. That is correct. There is no right. provision for a conservation land acquisition fund in the RSAs. This one under article is establishing that. No, it so doesn't. this is establishing only for the purchase of land. So we understand. What, what, <coughs> there's, there's also nothing in the RSAs that specifically gives a name to any capital reserve fund or anything else. Town meeting makes those designations. Okay. When town meeting votes a fund for the uh, appropriation for a conservation land or acquisition fund, that money by law has to go to the treasurer because it's not a general account that's hmm. authorized by the Department of Revenue but only authorized by town meeting. It has to be held by her. The conservation fund is authorized by the general statutes, and there are very specific funds, namely the appropriations not spent in the conservation appropriation are transferred there at the end of the year by law. Right, but there is, there is a distinction here in the sense that the Conservation Commission has authority over, sole authority over, the conservation fund. Not necessarily. Under the RSX. Not necessarily unless they're granted by some other means. But the RSAs themselves only grant the Conservation Commission uh, control of the conservation funds. Only for certain things. Other things have to be ratified by the selectmen. Okay. To be clear, we are not talking about the conservation fund in this Warren article. We That's are. Correct. We are. Well, then the and conservation. And this, the conservation no, I, I, I want to move on. on. This work uh, article is that is specifying that if these funds are appropriated, they will be used solely only. for this specific purpose. Exactly, that's an argument for another time. Tim. Right. Well, then we have we have a problem, Madam Chair, in that we had uh, two different meetings in the spring uh, from the former former finance director and then another meeting with the town treasurer telling us that, you know, here are the funds. Conservation Land Acquisition Fund is not on that list. I ask about it. They tell me it's called the Conservation Fund. So what is, what is the truth here? As far as it's been brought to this committee, uh, I guess the truth varies depending on the time of day or time of year. You know, this particular fund, this alleged uh, conservation Land Acquisition Fund, which I have no indication actually exists. Is this the same fund that you were proposing a couple weeks ago to uh, underwrite the repair of the Ice Pond Dam? Yes. All right. So, you know, and, repairing and, an ice and, pond... And if you'll read the warrant article, it says this fund is used to acquire, maintain, yeah. improve, protect, or limit the future use of or otherwise conserve and properly utilize open spaces and conservation easements in Hampton. This is the Ice Pond Dam is on open space that is under the auspices of the Conservation Commission. So according to this warrant article, which is the same language that was in the warrant article last year, maintaining these properties comes under the purview of these funds. Yeah, well, I'm not disputing the legality of that particular point, only the fact that we, for some reason, want to call it the Conservation Land Acquisition Fund when we use the money for something other than land acquisition, which is kind of like a, you know, kind of like a little bit of uh, confusing at me, at the very least. Additionally, is this the same fund that when the conservation budget, which is not fully expended in a given year, the balance of that fund does not return to the taxpayers. It's not put in the undesignated fund balance, as is other budget items. <coughs> but your balance, the, that is, say, the Conservation Commission's budget, any balance there is then placed into this fund or the Conservation Fund or both funds or well, either one. I mean, that money is retained under the control of the Conservation Commission, correct? The money's in this fund, correct. And so and it goes in this alleged land acquisition fund? No. No. 
Okay, so it goes into capital, the, the conservation fund. It goes into the conservation fund ah. established by statute. Okay, so we have two funds. One is the conservation fund and one is the conservation land acquisition fund. That's correct. I cannot support this, and I'm done. Thank you. Next. To conserve time, I have no questions. <laughs> Saying no questions. I think it's kind of interesting uh, that we went through two um, presentations of all the funds we had, and this was not mentioned, and that was specifically asked. I'm not going to belabor the point, but we got a problem right here in River City. That's all I have. I have no problem. All set, thank you. Good thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. okay. Do I have motion to recommend? I'll recommend it. I, I'll recommend Article 31. I, I think that uh, the Conservation uh, Commission, the people who make up the conservation uh, organization, have done an excellent job. I'll second it. They're trusted, and uh, I think $10,000 to keep the fund together and to allow them to, you know, to do what they've indicated in this article is at a dollar thirty for a, for a three hundred twenty five thousand dollar house is is minimal. Okay, I second it. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Opposed. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Madam Chairman, just a point of order. I think earlier in the meeting, was going to decide or determine that these votes are going to be on the ballot. Yes. As I, I just, you know, just so we don't rush through so that Joan gets mm -hmm. enough time to record <coughs> the numbers. Oh, she'll stop us. Trust All right, me. okay, just. Yes, these will be recorded on the ballot. One, yeah, what was the, what was the uh, <coughs> tally? Count the whole part. It was three, no, we have 14 people here, so it was 11. 11, 11 three, right? 11. Fred, just a question. Ma'am. Who is representing the Recreation Fund? Do you? Uh, she can't be here this evening. Okay, so we'll Skip move it. that one to Thursday. All right. Which, which article is that? 23. We probably can deal with that one. And is anybody here from the cemetery? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so we'll move that one to Thursday as well. Article what? 30. 30. Okay. Well, we'll move 30. Well, 30, we'll 30 is, is uh, that's the burial uh, trust. People. That's a selectman's article. Uh, I was looking at 27, remove okay, pine sorry. trees from Pine Grove Cemetery. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's so, a combination selectman and cemetery trust. Okay, so I'll move that to Thursday. You know, Madam Chairman, we, we could address the recreation fund. I mean, this well, we can, but you know what? We have others here. Okay, fine. If we have time at the end, okay, I'd be more than happy fine. to do that. But right now, take care of the people who are here. Exactly. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on to the CBAs, Article 14. That would be the CBA fire offices. Collective bargaining agreement. Yeah. Madam Chair, the uh, Board of Selectmen negotiated two uh, collective bargaining agreements this year. One with the firefighters, uh, that's local 2664, and one with the fire officers, local 3017. Uh, both of those contracts are for two years. Uh, they have been ratified by the Board of Selectmen, and I believe Monday and Tuesday they were ratified by both unions, and I'm getting a shake of the head from the un one of the union presidents behind me. So um, so they have been ratified by both parties and will appear on the warrant. <coughs> the uh, collective bargaining agreement basically is a 2% raise for each year for two years in each of those rank-and-file organizations. Uh, there were some minor changes in wording in the firefighters, for instance. Um, they had uh, removed some of the, or rather, requalified some of the things in the uh, sick bank, which is solely administered by the firefighters uh, and the police officers. 
Uh, that's outside the purview of the town. It's from the collective bargaining agreement. They contribute the time to that, and, and they have a system in using it. It's within the collective bargaining agreement. The uh, selectmen did negotiate a change in the steps for the fire officers. Uh, they split two of the steps so that um, instead of every uh, every five years, it's two and a half years, two and a half years, two and a half years, two and a half years. So they spread it out over a longer period of time, um, or the same period of time, but they cut it in half in each of the categories. And there were some minor word changes here and there on the contracts, and that's basically it. The, the thrust here basically is the increase in wages. Mm -hmm. That's the impact. And it's a straight 2% each one of those years? Yes, ma'am. That's for 13 and 14. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Fifteen, sixteen. It's just for part of seven, because yes. cool. right. it goes to March thirty-first. Right. So, so it would be effective April first of fifteen, and then expire on March thirty-first of, of seventeen. So that's why the three years are in right. the um, Warren article here, just so you can see the cost in each of the years. Yeah. But it is a two-year contract. They did not go to eighteen because of the um, federal health care statute. As you perhaps all know, you've heard of the Cadillac tax. Uh, that takes effect on January 1, 2018. <coughs> uh, they have made an agreement that it should, ta should take effect earlier. They will re renegotiate that provision to prevent the town and the union from being hit with tax penalties by the federal government. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what those tax penalties are going to be. Every that's in a state of flux. It's constantly changing. There are like 150 federal agencies writing <laughs> through regulations, and they change every other day. Uh, we have a the municipal association has a, uh, a full-time person working on just that. Uh, that's what he did uh, in, in his industrial uh, era, on his, his normal job before he retired and, and went to work for the association. He, uh, he handled federal insurance matters. And so we're looking at this on a daily basis. No one knows what's going to happen to this. It's going to be in 2018. So we purposely kept the collective bargaining contracts shorter of that particular goal so we know how to correct problems when they arise. Mm -hmm. And right now we only have one coverage um, that would, at this point in time, be part of the Cadillac tax. The questions that have to be answered between now and then uh, are how will that tax uh, calculate depending upon the cost of insurance and how that goes up between now and 2018. Uh, we've already been told that they're considering ratcheting the penalty so that basically the, the floor stays level each year as you go up, which is exactly what we hope they'll do. Mm -hmm. But that's something that needs to be seen as we go through. But I believe we have one employee who's retired Yep. who was on that insurance coverage. So how that will affect the retired employee, I can't answer, and I don't think the federal government can answer yet. So Maybe they'll be 65 by then. Uh, who knows? Uh, <laughs> 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 no clue. Okay. I've asked this in all of everything we've done so far. On Article 13, how many individuals are we talking about on that Warren article? It's 13. Uh, I mean, and I know that will be in flux in, in future years. Are we doing 13 or 14? 25 Well, 13 and 14 are the same. Uh, not we negotiated really. the same. The amounts are different. Uh, not exactly the same, Madam Chairman. Close enough. Yeah. There's 32 in on Article 13. That includes the firefighters and the um, fire alarm operators. That's good. Right. Okay, and an Article 14. 14? 13. 13. That's 13. That's the lieutenants, the captains, 14. the 14. 14. 14. Or 14. There's. I know, but there's 13. 13 and 14. There's 13 and 14. There's 13 and 14. Okay. There's 13, 13 people 14. covered on, uh, on Article 14. That covers 13 yeah. positions. It's Officers. captains, lieutenants, right. Right. the deputy, mm -hmm. and the um, administrative um, sec assistant, and the inspectors. How many were on 13? 14. 13 was 32. 32. And that's the firefighters <laughs> and the fire alarm operators. Well, thank you.
Okay, so Mike, you corrected me that between Article 13 and 14, they're not both identical? No, not for dollars. No, not. No, not for dollars. It wouldn't no. be because we have number of people. Right. No, well, they're two different unions. It's the Firefighter Local 2664 is that's on Article 13. But I'm, I'm saying the spirit of the contracts. Oh, yes, they're 2%, yeah. yes. That's, that's yes. what I'm getting at. Oh, I'm yes. sorry, The yes. spirit of both contracts <coughs> is the same. That's the, correct. The difference in amounts has sorry. to do with the number of individuals yes. That are covered under that <coughs> contract. Yep. That's correct. That is correct. So that nobody thinks that we're giving one group more money than we're giving another group. It's all the same at 2% for every one of those years, but there's a differentiation in the number of weeks in each of those given years because some of those years are not whole years correct. that we're budgeting for. It's 39, 52, and then 13. Okay. Have I got that right? Yep. That's correct. It ends up being two whole years, but yeah, that's why it's different. But essentially, you've done a good job between right. Article 13 and Article 14 to have everybody with some sort of parity. Right. right. Okay. I'm, anything else you want to add to this? Because I want to allow everybody... No. to ask their questions. Dave, we'll start with you. Um, <clears throat> normally I'm not a fan of shortening contracts or the length of them, but based on what you said about the changes coming, I think that was a, a wise move. So I agree with that. No question. That's it. Questions? I don't know. I think it's been negotiated. It looks fair to me. The dollar impact uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is minimal. Uh, I looked at uh, again the cost for a three hundred and twenty five thousand dollar home. It would be three dollars and ninety cents for the fire officers and eight forty five for the firefighters. I don't consider that knockout punches. So I would be okay with it. I'm all set. I'll start with it. Thank you. I guess if we're not gonna be knocked out we'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to be. They're coming. <laughs> and if you are, we have paramedics who can handle us. A couple of questions. Uh, last night, I was intently listening to the Board of Selectmen's meeting, as I often do, and uh, I saw uh, Mr. Sullivan's presentation on the contracts, and he made reference to some unspecified MOUs, memorandums of understanding. And it's still applied to both of these warrant articles. Is that true? That's true. It relates to the insurance. Okay. And, and, and uh, just we, the insurance. We, we, we did not want to incorporate something into the contract that would basically hold our feet in a, in a, in a firm setting of concrete. Uh -huh. So neither, neither side wanted to do that. So what they, what they did is they <coughs> left <coughs> excuse me, the availability of an MOU to address those issues should something happen with the federal regulation between now and the end of the contract. Okay, so the contract set, makes reference to a, uh, a memo of understanding. Yes. And that memo of understanding has not been written yet. No, no. It gives the ability to write one. Well, of course. To address that issue. Anyway, yeah, but it actually binds them to the memo you, assuming both parties agree, right, basically? Well, it's not written because we don't know what the extent of the federal regulation might be. Well, do I do understand why it's not written. It's because right. of the fog around Obamacare. It does basically. require them to sit and write a memorandum of agreement dealing with that matter should it arise. Right. So the agreement would be between... Two cents per thousand. The agreement would be between the, uh, who? The, the union and... And the town. Well, you mean the board selectmen or... The select one out of the town in this case by statute. Okay, so the town legislature is granting the Board of Selectmen authority to negotiate on their behalf and otherwise, assuming we pass it, of course. Well, the, the statute town grants the selectmen that authority. Uh, so why is the town legislature being asked to pass it at because all? Because they have to do the appropriation. Money. Right, so there'll be some exactly. appropriation associated with that MOU? No. Yeah. Well, it'll be no cost no matter what? Well, there may be down the line. Exactly. I don't, so I, we don't know when that would occur. Uh, and probably 2018, but if they should move that up, then the town would either have to pay the penalty or bear the cost. Right, but that would result in it being an appropriation not authorized by the town legislature. Well, town you know, meeting. not all appropriations are authorized by the legislature That's because some of them are evidence. authorized by Congress and the state legislature, and we have no choice but to expend them. So. And right, in that's those cases increasingly evident that the town meeting, the town legislature, the voters of this town have little 
very decreasing little control over there how their tax dollars are uh, raised and, 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 and spent it. I think that's growing, growingly clear. Yes. And I, I really, my no, no, not, that's not to blame anyone, All right. by the way. No, no. But my, honest, my honest answer Jim. to that is that you need to consult with your legislators because if, if the town of Hampton, like some other communities in the state, had what we refer to as an open town meeting, that is to say there is no SB2, it's, it's yeah, a real town meeting, the yeah. old-fashioned town meeting, yeah. okay? If you look at the legislative history of the old-fashioned town meeting, the legislature won't touch that with a five-meter cattle prod. They do nothing for that unless it's required by the courts. Mm -hmm. SB2, we amend it with all kinds of laws and regulations every single year. So every time you say that statement, it's because the legislature has changed the law that allows or requires certain things to be done by the town, whether the town meeting passes it or not. Mm -hmm. So this is a consequence of SP2. It's a consequence of the legislature. Well, a consequence of the legislature changing the parameters of SP2. Yeah, that's okay. true. Okay. I'm going to ask you both to move I'll move on, on to a different topic now. I'd like the, the topic to be only the, the CBAs. Well, that's all I've been talking about. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, the, uh, you made many references to Obamacare. That seems to be the problematic uh, piece with regard to both of these contracts, both of these Warren articles which are contracts, um, and you, you said that uh, there's a lot of agencies, federal, federal agencies making changes constantly, and the uh, NHMA has got someone working full-time on this, and they've got our back on this, I guess, in terms of keeping us informed, right? They have, yes. Okay. And we can trust them to, to do that. They've given us the right information so far. Okay. Unfortunately, they don't give us the right information on, on uh, contract, multi-year contracts, though. Are you done? No, Your opinion, questions. not mine or theirs. Thank you. <laughs> no further questions. Bob? I have no questions. Okay. Glenn? No questions. I do have a couple of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was looking at Article 14, significantly different than 13 in relation to the total of the changes uh, that are specified by 2015 through 17. The total for the Article 14 for 2015, the grand total for that amount on uh, Article 14 is 88,000, give or take a few dollars. If you compare that to the uh, CBAs that were passed in 12 and 13, it was only 12.7. And I'm wondering what the differences would be between 12, 13 versus um, 15, whatever you want to call this, the two years that are in this contract. I can't tell you that. What I can tell you is that there are no steps in, in 30.17. They are, they are all flat rates, and, and uh, we're, what we're doing is we're changing the flat rates. In, in 2664, there are steps. There are no steps in the, for the officers. And then going back to 13, which has <coughs> got a different issue completely, is that on <coughs> the 1213, for the amount there that's listed there, the grand total is 160000 and in 2013, it was 175,000, which was higher, but it included six years of steps. So that explained that one, but I'm having a real problem with 14. So that leads me to the next question. Can we have copies of the tentative agreements? I don't think they've been written. Uh, I don't have them yet, let's put it that way. When will they be available for the public? I can't answer that question, I'm not writing them. Because we put them up on the website before when they've been available. Yeah, I, I, I can't answer the question. I'm not writing them. So. Well, the reason why I ask that is because if you're looking at 14, it's awful hard for me in my own mind from information that's in this one article to figure out how we jump from $12,000, give or take, in 12-13 to 88000 on this one article. That's a 300% uh, 400% increase. Well, you got to remember something that in 2013, yeah. that was ordered by a, a, a mediation, uh -huh. and and it was a one percent increase, I believe. One and a quarter, if I one believe. One quarter, one, something one like a that, quarter, yeah. something of that nature. Okay, mm -hmm. and it was for one year, not two. Oh, it was for two years. Yeah, yeah, it was for two. No, it was for one year. You're talking about the 14, 13, 12, 13 was for two years, and it was 12, seven, and eight, 88 for this round. So I guess what we need for me to even begin to consider this one article is I need to see the tentative agreement so we can actually see what we're getting 
as taxpayers. And I think that everybody on this budget committee should demand to see the tentative agreements before we agree to recommend or not recommend this one article. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, something you didn't mention, Fred, is this was done without outside counsel? Yeah, we, we, we did not spend the $17,000 that was allocated to this for outside counsel. Which helps. And also that it was done in, in, a, in, a, rather, in a collaborative fashion between the two groups in a, in a very quick, it was not a very uh, lengthy procedure. And the union and the town did get together and, and yep. worked this out pretty well. We've done in three meetings. Normally it takes many, many, many months and many meetings. So, but we did not do it with a legal counsel, and that may have helped us. I'm all set. I'm seeing very clear. Who, who represented the town for the negotiation? Uh, the chairman of the board of selectmen, uh, the human resource officer, and I believe the fire chief. <coughs> was it the chief? No. Who no. was the other person present? <laughs> ah, town council. But that's oh, okay. already paid for. Town council. Yeah, we didn't have outside council do any work on, on labor relations at all. I hate to get into the years that we spent more money on legal fees than we did actually paying the people who worked very hard for us. I find <coughs> that you could negotiate this 20 times over. The bottom line is that it's fair and it's, it's the budget is, is there at 2%. I mean, that's almost at the cost of living increase. So I see no problem with it whatsoever. Um, do I have... Would you like me to make a motion I for both 13 and, and 14? 14? Second. Will there still be an opportunity for a discussion, Madam Chair? We just had it. Are you both on? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like an opportunity to have a discussion, please. We just went around the table. What part of that did you miss? Well, I'd like to follow <coughs> up, uh, in particular, with some of the things that Fred had said uh, regarding uh, there not being a written agreement, or at least he doesn't have in possession of one, and he's not writing it. And there is a tentative agreement which is a, a TA for the individual items that were negotiated, but that does not rewrite the entire contract <coughs> that has to be done. And when <coughs> so what you got is an outline, basically. Yeah, well, we have the items that were changed, okay? The, the, the language changes here and there, and the dollar value. Um, that, that's been TA'd, and, and normally what happens in negotiations is you have a slip of paper with uh, Article number 14 of the contract, and we want to change the word and to the word the. Well, I understand the, the, the outline is where we are now, yeah. but before we get to town meeting, will we have it completed, the actual agreement completed? I can't tell you that. Uh, it's a lengthy process. Uh, town meeting is coming earlier this year than it has before because of the deliberative session. Um, it's going to be in January rather than February. What happens in, in preparing that contract is that it's typed or into the computer. Yeah. Uh, it is then read by both councils, for one for the town, one for the, each union. And then each of the changes are run against the prior year contract word for word for the entire contract mm -hmm. to make sure everything is absolutely identical. And that takes a considerable amount of time. It's done at least twice. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's hopefully no errors in, in, in what's actually going to be signed. That's not signed until after the town ratifies it. That is after the town meeting. After the town meeting. You, you cannot sign the contract until the town meeting ratifies it. So the contract itself won't be finalized. I don't mean in terms of signing. I mean in terms of the actual text of the contract. That won't be finalized until after that, the town that meeting? That will be finalized sometime between now and the time they sign it. I just can't tell you when because I'm not the one preparing it. Uh, it will be. It's who, is, probably, who is preparing it? I don't know. I, I'm not part of the negotiating team, so I can't tell you. How do we know that the text before us is is you know an accurate reflection of the outline if we don't if no one has seen the outline? Well, right. the people who prepared the that prepared the text. Oh, this is not unusual. Well, it may not be unusual, but it it's, certainly it's not is unusual and uh, just go something a bit that's further, you know you put before us is kind of like Jim? you know maybe it is this and no uh, maybe it's not you know right. well maybe I'll vote for it and maybe I'll not that's all the Warren article before you 
speaks to a dollar value. That well, maybe it doesn't. That, well, that's not going to change. Well, we don't know. We haven't seen anything. Well, then I suggest right, you vote, vote accordingly. I, I, um, I, I will. I'll vote. All right. N we had the motion. And it was seconded. Second. Yep. Yeah. All right. All those, uh, let's do one at a time. Let's do 13 first. Okay. We'll still have both. No, we're going to do three. We'll do them individually. On 13, all those in favor. Now, are we, we're voting in favor to recommend. recommend. All rec we're recommending recommend. 13. Recommend. Right. Just whatever language comes out. Change. Recommending. <laughs> whatever language comes out. Okay. Yeah. Opposed? Just two and abstention. I abstain. I abstain. All right. And the count, please. We have, okay, one, one. we have one no and one abstention. One of, yes. So there's 12, 12, 12, 12, 1, 12, 1, 1. Okay. Almost like 9, 1, 1. All right, here we go. All, All right, right, going on to 14. <laughs> do I have a motion to recommend? I, I already made that motion to recommend. Oh, we're doing each one. Oh, second. Okay. second. And Brian seconded. Brian seconded. Okay. okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Abstain. Okay. 12 1 and 1 again. 12 1 and 1. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just waiting to see where she's going to go next. Okay, say. Well, <laughs> keeping it in order. I can change my vote later, like the text, right? Tim, come on. Tim? <laughs> Your 20 minutes of fame is up. <laughs> Was that 20 minutes? It seemed long. only that way. Right? <laughs> 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 so it's 15, you give 20. Okay, Article 15. Which article are we doing now? 15. 15. 15. Next one down. Ma'am, I come before you tonight, and I thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm coming with Captain Kennedy as well, as we have seen you uh, recently within the last month. I, um, I have two presenting in front of you this evening. They're out of order. If you'll let me, I'll speak on both. All right. All right. I have uh, Article 15, and I also have Article 29. So to that end, um, Article 15, I'll read it so that everybody understands. Shall the town vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $615,000 in accordance with the long-range capital expenditures program of the town to purchase um, of a fire engine pumper for Hampton Fire Department to replace the 1988 Emergency One pumper that will be uh, disposed of by trade, sale, or auction as directed by the Board of Selectmen in the best interest of the town. This shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32, colon 7, uh, Roman numeral 6, and will not lapse until the vehicle purchase is made on or by March 31st, 2017, whichever sooner majority vote is required. The fiscal impact will be estimated to be 22 and one ten cent per thousand. For Mr. Zanoy, I did the math out, sir. Based on a $325,000 house, that is a $71.83 cent. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out is that this purchase of a fire engine, our fire engines tend to last. What we do is we purchase a fire engine with the intent of leaving it 10 years on the front line and 10 years in reserve. So, sir, to continue on that math principle, if we may, I divided the 7183 by 20 years. So each year per house, $325,000 comes to be $3.59. Okay. Gotcha. Sir. <laughs> I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> so you're actually saying we're going to put it. I don't, I don't need that. Cut that fine. You're 1 through 19, huh? <laughs> 2 through 20. Uh, that doesn't quite fit. Anyway, go ahead. What is wrong, by the way, with the current pumper? The current 1988 fire engine is uh, no longer up to standard. It's cost us a little over $11,000 since 2012 to maintain the pump and its rated capacity. Uh, that's just the pump. We've been put on notice and told that we need a new power plant, the engine. That's going to cost between fifteen dollars and $30,000 just to rehab. We have been quoted the same price for an engine replacement. This is a 1988 pump, and at the time it was state-of-the-art. Um, I recommend that we get a new one because this one is six years past our 20-year goal. Um, the one that's currently serving Frontline is Engine 2. It's a Smeal. <coughs> it was purchased in 2002. We're currently at a 12-year uh, mark on this one. We're already actually with, we're at 13 years. We're in, in a new year now and I have to change my mouth. 
but we're at 13 years. We're already three years past where we want to leave it as a frontline piece. So very frequently, the frontline piece will go down, whether it's for maintenance or even oil changes. If it's out of the fire, uh, fire station for any length of time, engine four becomes the frontline pumper. So we have a 26-year-old piece of apparatus that's working as a frontline pump. Uh, it's got a lot of problems. It's very small by comparison, and our job has grown significantly in the last 27 years to include a lot of EMS. We have a lot of equipment that just doesn't fit. Now, does it put out the same gallons per minute that the uh, we're still going to have ISO a, people uh, require for this 1988? True, we're going to have a 1500 gallon a minute pump. What, oh, this one? What is, what is this one putting? The out? new one or oh, the old one? The 1988. What's that putting out? Uh, now the rate of capacity is actually. Oh, we have to overclock the uh, the pump, and we're barely getting to to the rate of capacity. You're, you're so. getting it at 1500. Right. Well, it continues to cost. Um, last you year. You say 11 thousand dollars over three years. Oh yeah, it was actually two at the time the calculations came in. That but yes, 15 to 30 to rehab it. Uh, no, that's the engine. Yeah. So the difference is that we have an engine to drive the truck to wherever we're going. Mm -hmm. We also have a pump. The pump inside pumps the water. We get it from the hydrants, we get it from where we're getting it. So we have to move that water. That pump is going to be 15 to, I'm sorry, the engine is going to be 15 to $30,000 to replace. The pump has cost us $11,000 just to maintain so that For three years. Yeah. We've spent over $67,000, I believe it's since 2006, in maintaining mm -hmm. this piece. You explained a lot of this when they were in here before. Right. Well, I have a major problem with this, and um, I'll tell you wh what it is. It's a matter of philosophy here. I see town sharing. I see Hampton Falls, Hampton, Northampton, and Rye have less than 30,000 people. And I see four fire departments, four chiefs, four deputies. Everybody's asking for pumpers, ladders. Pumpers are five, 600,000. Ladders are seven to 800,000. We can't afford it. I'm looking for shared services. I see Berwick working with Kittery, sharing a police chief, sharing recreation, sharing a transfer station they're talking now. I hear Rye talking to Portsmouth about sharing with fire uh, department. <coughs> Towns can't afford five to $600,000 pumpers every three or four years. And they can't afford $800,000 ladder trucks. You've got to get involved, and it's got to come from the town manager to the selectmen to get the other town administrators and managers to agree in principle and set you fire chiefs off on a mission to start talking with one another about sharing services. That's where I'm coming from. I don't endorse this. I believe we've got to start talking about sharing services. I came from Natick, Mass. and had 30,000 people, one fire chief. Well, that explains it. Okay, and one deputy, and it had you know what it needed for apparatuses. But here, everybody's got you know everybody hugs their own tree. They got parochialism. We got to get off that. We got to hold hands and start to share services. That's where I'm coming from. I can't endorse this article. Plus, from a dollars and cents point of view, you've only spent eleven thousand dollars over a couple of years on the pump, fifteen to thirty to rehab the engine. You're still pumping at the gallons per minute. I don't see where you're in a desperate situation. Jerry. Thank you for sharing. Jim? Well, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can I do know, it. I, I look at this um, in a couple of different ways. Um, we, we talked about the schools a little bit earlier, and we talked about how important it is to keep the schools maintained, to put the money into the schools, and to have a regular funding uh, mechanism that allows the schools to stay in the pristine condition that we talked about. I don't know how this is any different. Um, we have a 26 or a 28 year old pumper that I don't want to depend upon it. I don't care if you spent $11,000 in the last three years, the, it's on its last legs. They, they, there's a shelf life on these things and we're past it. When that's acting as a frontline piece, the town's not being served properly. It costs money. I mean, and there's a, uh, things Jerry just talked about, regionalization may be something we can discuss. But if we're going to start talking about a, a city the size of Natick, which may be that big an area, or if we're going to be waiting for a pumper truck to come to my house that's coming from Northampton or coming from Rye, I don't really want to sit by and wait for that. At some point, if we want to talk about a complete regionalization, 
and we want to talk about reload, relocating fire stations so that the response time is equal to everybody in those communities, I'll be glad to take part in that. I don't think we have time for those discussions while we're dealing with a 28-year-old truck. I, I think the need is in front of us. I, I think that the work has been put into this. They're, they're showing that uh, the thing is slowly dying. And talk about throwing good money after bad. I, I just think that the, the time to act on this is now. We, we have the uh, deputy chief uh, telling us that this is what's important. Uh, it's, things cost money. Things cost a lot of money. But when you're dealing with, with the health, health and safety of, of the people in town, sometimes you have to spend that money. So I'll support this. Thanks, sir. I think when you were here last time, you told us that this could be it registered as an antique. Absolutely. Correct. So you could use this in an antique <laughs> fire engine Absolutely parade. Correct. Yeah, that's Currently good. under the DOT regs in New right. Hampshire. And I think qualified. when we talk about Hampton, we have to also think of the summer. No question. And we have 14,000, 15,000 people, but in the summer we can quadruple that. And all the cottages you have down there and everything, so the, the fire danger is a lot more. And I agree that I'm, I don't want to wait for somebody to come from Seabrook or somebody to come from Northampton. And I agree with what Jim said, and I, I back that up, and I, I back up what you want. And I, I think it costs money, but I think you got you got you got to start keeping up. A lot of things cost money, but if you don't do them, yes, sir, it's going to cost more money. At the direction of the the board of selectmen last year, we did price this out, and it was seven a little. Oh, I'm sorry, it was between. It was about five hundred ninety-five thousand dollars. Based on that pricing, it's gone up three percent in the last year. So over 12 months, their increase has been passed on, and that's why the, the price point is where it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I just have a, one point. Uh, buying a new pumper when it's that old, I don't really have a big problem with. I know they're very expensive. What really annoys me, along with some of what Jerry said, some of that's got to be considered at some point in time, but what I really get annoyed with is we take the pumpers and we beat the stuffing out of them every time there's an ambulance call. We take them out here, we take them out there, they get run all over the countryside. And that isn't the purpose of life. It's to pump water. So I have a big problem with the way we operate that faction of the business. And that just wears these pumpers right on down. If you keep out taking them every time there's an ambulance call and you go whizzing down these roads around Hampton, which are sometimes narrow and sometimes a little bumpy, uh, that's I'm not DPW, Mr. Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, but I'm just saying we're, we're beating, the, beating the pumpers up for a problem that I don't think we should be using them for. So that's all I have to say about this. Thanks, sir. Glenn. No problems. Uh, I'm fully in support of getting this pumper. Uh, for everything that's been said in favor of it, but also because I think we have to send a message as a representative body to the community that when you neglect the safety departments in the community, we're all going to pay the price. The pumper is one part of the problem. I also think the fire department needs more staffing. Uh, it came to my attention that when Marine One, you correct me, Chief, if I'm wrong, if Marine One goes out to address a rescue, 75% of everyone on duty is engaged in that rescue. So uh, we can have 100% of our involved duty crew at that rescue. That, that to me is the pumper in the next chapter. We've got to start looking at the safety issues and start supporting things that may cost money but are critical to the town. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Tim? In spite of that argument, I'm going to support this uh, Warren article. Thank you. Uh, because, Jerry, it doesn't knock me out. <laughs> well, moving on to Steve. <laughs> I just want to add that this is the uh, the old Hampton Beach pump up, correct? This is Engine 4, correct. Mm. So the town never purchased this. The village district paid for this back in 1988. It was a freebie. <laughs> 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 it wasn't a freebie. We paid for it. In 1988, this uh, it was actually manufactured in 1987. The purchase price then was $156,777.16. Mm -hmm. You've come a long way, baby. Right. Uh, you know, that was paid for by the village district. It's going to be an experience Hampton parade. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we've got to keep it just for that. You know? <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> I think uh, that we put this off three or four or five years when we were in the process of trying to get the stations <coughs> done. And I, we all knew it was coming along. It was just we needed a place to keep it. And the stations were the priority. Certainly. Now it's time to purchase this. This was actually on the capital improvement plan in 2005. Right. So it's 10 years that it's been on that long range uh, we, capital we improvement. We struggled with the two stations for a long time. Amen. And now <laughs> we need to start bringing this stuff forward. I'm in support of this. Thank you, sir. Well, as an antique, maybe we could rent it out for parades, but to fight battles with fires, and especially with the sizes of the buildings that we're building. I, I certainly don't want to trust my firefighters to it any longer. And, that, and I believe that. Um, I have absolutely no problem with this. As Mike said, it was put on the back burner um, to pass other things through and not overburden the taxpayers. The, the time has come. I like the fact that there is a plan you know, 10 years <coughs> in, it goes to the second string and so on and so forth. And now we're already, we've already exceeded that timeline. So what's the sense in even having a plan if you have no intentions of keeping it? The other thing, and pardon me all for putting this commercial in, this would be something that, Fred, that would qualify if we were to implement the impact fees. Yes, it would. Okay. I do not, for the life of me, know why this town passed impact fees for both municipal and schools and is not using the municipal portion of that enactment because this is something that I certainly wouldn't pay in entirety for this, this vehicle, but it would certainly have taken a little bit of a bite if it had been used all the way along. So I don't know. Is there room to actively open that conversation? It's not going to change this Warren article right now, but I guess my next question would be, is there time and is there room to tune up that impact between now and the time we actually pay the bill? That you're going to have to discuss with the planning board yeah. because they have exclusive jurisdiction over that. Well, I suggest that I, I do. I say no. I suggest that I do, but I also suggest that I get some support from the select board, if you would, and from the town manager, if you would, and from the department heads, because we passed that impact fee. It needs a tune-up. I understand that. There are <coughs> mechanisms. It doesn't fund everything. But we're sitting here again one more time tonight talking about impact fee. The school is going to possibly be able to use it, and this is a prime example of something we would have been able to use it for, I do believe. We've all been to the planning board and asked them to implement the answer. No. Well, I believe that if we all put a little bit of pressure, maybe they will hear us a little bit well, better. I haven't gone yet, have uh, and I'm just, I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> Um, but I'm totally in favor of this. I'm also totally in favor of finding other means of funding it that are already available to us. Jerry? No, I oh, just... you already... Got, I already, already made my done. comments. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's still knocked out. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like, like to make one further comment. That is to say that if we take the town budget proposal as is, and all the warrant articles as is, there's going to be almost a $600 impact on every house worth 325000 and most of the houses, that's the average home in Hampton. So we got to be geared about picking and choosing in these things mm -hmm. because every this is a $71 impact. you got $60, $80 impacts. you get got a bunch of 40 All adds up to about 600 bucks between the town's proposed budget and the warrant article. So even the small ones add up, right? They add up. Okay. They all Richard, add up. i got my eyes on them. You're saying that this, this fire truck was purchased by the Hampton Beach Village District back in 1988. 87. 87. I was a sophomore in high school, guys. And, then, my turn, and then turned over to the town yeah. when the district went out of the fire protection business. Uh, 98. Right. right. Yeah, I it was. Well, I guess the taxpayers have pretty much got the value yeah, they got the out of this, this vehicle. So I guess maybe it is time to pony up and get a new one. So I'm in favor of it. Are you Thanks. saying the precinct should buy another one? No, I'm oh. saying <laughs> so I believe the VD sold all of the fire equipment to the town for Gave. $1. Well, mm. Okay. Yeah, one, uh, one buck. Again, so like let's I said, get I think back. All of the equipment. 
Right. Let's get back no. on the Warnock. Any, all right, Brian. I'm in favor of it. Okay, <laughs> Brian. Um, maybe a little encumbrance. We'll check that for the uh, village district and see if we can add that to it. <laughs> um, you mean we get the trade-in value? <laughs> yeah. We get the buck. Yes, yeah. you can yeah. have it. We get it back from the buck. <laughs> Do you know what the average response time is for we're, a call in Hampton? For, uh, for for our beach and town districts, we're well within the four and a half national standard guidelines. Um, for our rural district, we are still within four and a half. But obviously, once we reach the Exeter border, we're we're at our maximum there. But we're well within because of our stations, and you know this Great. is this is by design. Um, we're well within. The next article that I'm going to be talking to you about kind of leads on to that so okay well no my point I was understand. is if someone's going to come from hampton falls or something like that significantly out of time out of time okay. and i know the previous chief busted his butt to keep those things down right um and i not to mention the fact that the 1988 has been since i've been on this board it's come up every year certainly and every year you turn it down it's been turned down and it's about time we fix that problem Thank, Sunny? You. Thank, you, Thank you, sir. I'm in favor of this project. I mean, a lot of issues have been raised. The town should address in the future, but you have to move along. And the future is now. Thank you, sir. Um, I think when it has to do with emergencies that both the fire and police do, time is of the essence. This is not a place we should be cutting corners. So I agree with Jerry that we've got to look at the whole picture. But this is in need of being done. I 100% propose that we accept it. It's recommended. Thank you, sir. Do I have a motion I here will recommend, to recommend? I would like second. to recommend this. Second. second. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Do you in favor? 13 one. Okay. 13-1. I'd like to move 13-1. Uh, yes, Article yep. 29. <laughs> Second. Thanks, All in sir. favor? Whoa. Can we read it first? Can we read it first? That's a traffic what? control. 25,000 bucks for a 12 traffic control at the beach fire station. Small amount. Not, not. Con Can't argue with that, Tim. Let's just pass right. it. That's we'll the kind on. of money I like to see. Amen. We don't need discussion. Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay. So you Oh, Article twenty nine. He he, he jumped it? in yes. and moved it. I'm not going to take ten minutes to discuss it. No, no. So. Let's go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, the question I have is: Are these going to be like stoplights, or with the same kind of thing we had before, like we saw before? Okay. So where we had them, the locations will be will be changing because of obviously where our apron has changed right. now. Um, but otherwise, it'll be exactly what yeah, they want. Well, like if, you have, if you have to go out on fire or an alarm, you you put the lights. Yeah, your that's correct. It's that's automatic. Correct. Right? We're going to stop traffic. Well, we're going to have a means to do it with Opticom. We're going to have a means to do it with automatic. We're going to have a means to do it also with uh, with um, manual control. Right. So new and we'll improved. improved. New and improved. No. New and improved. Absolutely. No problems. Two dollars and ninety three cents. Yeah. One question. Let's do it. Does anybody one question, by hands? Anybody actually have a question on this one? I have one yes. question. All Sorry. right, Stephen. It's and not. It's going to be only activated when you need it for an emergency, right. correct? Not on normal traffic days, correct. Right. Only during emergencies. Not is when he's going for coffee. No, yet. no. What <laughs> I'm asking is that this is not going to be a traffic That's time. correct. No. Only, only during response times. Um, we have in, in the past, especially on really busy day, 90 degree days down at the beach, um, in order to back in. However, we've changed our back in because we've elongated our apron so much. We don't have to go out into the middle of traffic to do so. So this is going to be only on responses. Plus you're on Nashville. Well, this came up during the village well, district. Well, we're going to have to respond up All right. to D. All those in favor? All right. The one I don't have a problem. Unanimous. Unanimous. Oh. Thank you all very much. Thank have a great you. night. Happy Thank New you. Year. Good night. Thank you. Where do you want to go now, Eileen? Well, okay. we're going to be with Chief for a little while. Um, We're going to be here a little while. We're going past 10 oh, tonight. No, I no, no. The building stayed with us. Yeah. Amanda, you only have one, so come on down. Come on. Which, which, which article is that now? That's the library. library. Article number 24. Thank you. 24? Yep. Article 24. 24. I'll we'll move article 24, Madam Chair. All right. Second from Michael. 
Amanda, thank you for your patience. Absolutely. Anybody who's left here, thank you for your patience tonight. <coughs> and to think we used to do everything in one night. This is pretty straightforward from my point of view. Well, Amanda's given us a little so. bit um, of a presentation, so. It's a handful of photographs just so you have a sense for what the equipment we're talking about looks like. If you want to skip it, <laughs> like you did on Jeremy's, <laughs> I'm fine with that. Someone make a motion? I did. Tim, it's done. Seconded. And it's been it's seconded. Done. <laughs> Let's vote. Jim, we're already in discussion. Take the book. We're in discussion. We're in discussion. We're in discussion. Discussion, fine. Okay. I don't object. It seems to me, I Amanda, do. I'd like to ask a question. Oh, Wait please. a Wait. All right. Okay. <laughs> Wait. For all intents and purposes, I would like Amanda to do a brief presentation of this so that people at home know what we're asking for here. Okay. And then I'd like to go in order around the table. If nobody minds. I'm going to skip okay. this because I don't see the program. Um, okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Two it's items. New carpeting throughout the building, right? It's new carpeting throughout the first floor. Okay. Quiet on the right. Um, in 2008, we came forward with an entire um, HVAC revamp as an article, 350000 That failed. We've been working at repairing the HVAC, upgrading the HVAC the best we can, a little at a time. We did the um, energy audit with the help of the energy committee. Some things we got um, zero interest loans for, some things we paid for. So the majority of this article goes to more of that, more of the things we need to be chipping away at to, to upgrade, fully upgrade our HVAC. Um, the thermostats, I mean, it, it's, you know what they are. Um, how many do you have? Uh, I don't know. Ours don't work very well over here. I don't know how many <laughs> we have. Um, they're pneumatic, but the, the hoses that feed them are all deteriorating and they're old, they're leaking. They feed to a compressor in the basement. So that compressor, a is not covered under our um, our service contract because the equipment is too old to be covered. Um, <laughs> it's expensive to repair. Makes an unbelievable noise almost all day long because of the leaks in the hoses up to the pneumatic thermostat. So the replacement for the thermostats will all be digital. The compressor will be completely removed from the building. We no we won't have one anymore. Good. And then the other thing is the the fan coils, which are like the big boxes that either the cool air or the hot air come out of, considering whatever time of year it is. Um, there are 20 of those throughout the building and all of ours are in terrible condition. We're paying, you know, a little bit here and there every year to repair valve actuators or other leaks, different things that are wrong with it. This would be getting those out of there. As I say, they're 30 years old, putting in new fan coils everywhere within the building. So that's the majority of the article. It's, when I'll give you, it's 103,488. That's for the thermostats and the fan coils. So let me understand this. You've replaced the power plant. Yes. HVAC. Yes. But not the mechanisms that run it and give us the most efficiency. Right. Well, <laughs> I mean, when you, you can see the drop off in our energy usage. The Based boilers. Based on the unit. But if, the, yes. if, if it's not sending. Right. It's not communicating very well. We do, we do anticipate we're not seeing maximizing some the energy savings additional savings. The when, the energy, when the auditors came through, in their recommendations were for the boilers and the chiller because those were going to be the single most effective ways to save energy and, and be able to pay it back with um, utility mm -hmm. costs. The, they knew that these things were also old and not working well, but they did not think that they were going to be as much of a cost savings, even if they were upgraded, which is why they weren't proposed to be done first. Is that? I wouldn't mm -hmm. call those people back again, mm -hmm. but yeah. Um, so that's the story there. And then the other piece is the carpet. Um, no less important, though it's m serving more of an aesthetic purpose than a than a facilities purpose. Um, Twenty three thousand three hundred twenty four dollars. It's almost the entirety of the first floor. There are a couple of areas where we have new carpeting. The teen area and the Dearborn Red Room have both been recarpeted. Where we have tile, all of the tile is in good condition, so that also will not be replaced. But it is eighty eighty five percent of the first floor. Um, that carpet is also also thirty years old. It's got rippling. It's got places where the seams are coming apart. It has many, many stains. It's not an attractive carpet anymore. Um, the proposal will all be for um, carpet tile, which will allow us, hopefully, to have a nice long life with it, but also 
as stains come up that can't be taken out, we can just pop in a new square. So that's my story. Okay. I'll start on this end of the table. Which I have nothing. I have a question for you. Well, Jim's for you. Jim? Uh, is the carpet moldy or anything, or it's just... No mold, but there's definitely uh, many, many stains. Um, I, only, I only have one question, Madam Jim. How much money are you contributing towards these items out of the trust fund? We recently purchased the photocopies of the building needed out of the trust fund, uh -huh. so we are asking that this money come from taxpayer. But nothing towards this? Yes, correct. Okay. That's all I have. No questions. No questions. All set, thank you. All set. All right. Sure. Did you get a bid on this? We went with um, our current contractor and the contractor that did the HVAC work at the new fire stations. They both prepared proposals for us, and we averaged them together to come up with a, with a figure. And the carpeting was the same thing. We talked to a different uh, a carpet that's been in the building before and a few others just to get a ballpark number to this put. This strikes me as, as a lot of money for replacing fan coils and thermostats and some carpet. $126,812. Well, I can tell you that... Um, Let's see. The difference between, well, I'm, even even the two contractors we had in to talk about the thermostats and the fan coils, the difference is is really remarkable. There's a there's a wide margin there, and we went with the lower, the low. We went on the low end of things, so we were trying to be How as about, uh, asking another contractor. To we couldn't attract, get anybody else to come. Um, there's a lot of engineering work that they have to do to come up with the numbers, oh, really? and they weren't interested. They really. When you say fan coils, what are those? I mean, tell me what these fan coils are. It's a, it's a. I mean, it looks like a box. It's not something that's very impressive, but it's, it's got the blowers inside it. It's got the coils inside it. and It's got the filters inside it. So it's, it's receiving the chilled water. It's going traveling across the blowers and coming out of the coils. I, I don't know that much about it, but <laughs> I'd be happy to show you. Must be like the coil in the back of your refrigerator. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 The and and thermostats throughout the building is twenty of them. Is that what it is? Or it's probably not twenty, um, because the the main floor of the library really is operated with just three controls. So probably less than twenty, but I don't know how many. I didn't count them. It's just a, I, I, that's what struck me when I saw this article. I read it was the cost for what you were asking for the thermostat replacement. You know, you can go to Home Depot and see thermostats that you can buy for fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars mm -hmm. to replace the ones in your home type of thing. So I, I don't know. I, I, it's, 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 I can't. I guess I can't draw a relationship between the value of what you're asking for and the dollars. Uh, that's that's kind of where I am on this. <coughs> it's impacting only fourteen ninety five per thousand for for fourteen dollars and ninety five cents <coughs> in total for a three hundred twenty five k home. But it's still uh, that's what struck me on this was the mm -hmm. dollar amount for what you're getting. I would not disagree with you. When we first came back with the first set of numbers, we were all surprised too. But having gone to a second company that quoted significantly more, that's what these things cost. Mm. Okay, that's Richard. all I have to say. Richard? No, I'll say. Brian? I don't understand the reason why you wouldn't take any more plan on using any of the trust fund Well, I mean, money. the trust fund money is there for our backup in our emergency. We are expending 18000 on the copiers, and so that was really what we felt comfortable parting with at this point in time. And how much is in there now, roughly? $128,000. And that does not include the 18000 the That does include the eighteen. Okay. Okay, hmm, that's it. Thanks. Sunny? Uh, uh, if you recall, I was a trustee of the library when we got the, the new equipment and the, the boilers and the air conditioning and the chiller. And at the time, they said there was no reason to do the rest, you know, the room units because they're really just cosmetic. I recall that when I was the trustee, you you have the bathroom in the basement and you have to replace the carpeting because every time you lost power, it flooded. Yes. And we solved that problem by just putting a solenoid switch in there for a few hundred dollars so it cuts the 
water to the bathrooms when you lose power. So we, we solved that problem. This is strictly cosmetic and I really don't see any need, no rushing need to do it when we have so many issues in the rest of the town. We need streets to pave and sidewalks to <coughs> redo. And I have to disagree. It's not cosmetic. It's well, it's it's similar to painting the acoustical tiles in the ceiling. Okay. Painting the acoustical tiles was cosmetic. Right. This is not cosmetic. <laughs> okay. You can't That's heat and cool the building <laughs> adequately without fan coils and a thermostat that work. <laughs> we have several that don't function at all. We're fixing them every single summer because they're breaking down. They're 30 years old. This is oh. not a cosmetic choice. Yeah, well, one, one much suggestion I might have is in the summer, instead of opening the doors, they keep the doors closed. And that's going to stop the leaking. I'm talking the front door. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to vote against it. So. <laughs> Dave? Um, no questions. I support. Okay. The only disappointment I have, Amanda, is that when we addressed the um, HVAC last year, Mm. Um, 2012. 2012, that the thermostats and that wasn't put in there as so in its entirety. 2012 was the approval of the Unitil loans, the zero interest loans. So it was a no money article. We didn't want to interfere with that at all. We wanted that to go through with the zero imp tax impact that it had. We wanted to defend yeah, that. But it, I think it'll, I, I can understand that going forward. Mm. That only gave us half the deal, though, because the other half is this $103,000. And quite honestly, if you can have a new system, but if what you have driving that system is inadequate, you weren't getting your efficiency as you should have. And you've probably endured um, quite a bit. I, I know you call anybody for a, a unit or a thermostat for a repair and you're talking about a lot of money just in repairs and that you're throwing out the window. Sure. I would have preferred perhaps in 2012 to have seen the scope of everything. Well, and that's, everyone saw the scope of everything in 2008 and the town people said, no, thank you. Well, we, we heard that pretty loud and pretty clear. Sometimes you got to come back and, and, and talk to us more. I'm, I'm mm. assuming you're going to be in your job for a very long time. So going forward in the future to bring it all to us um, well, the, w the final component will be the pipes that feed the water throughout the building. You haven't seen that number and neither have I. Mm -hmm. But it, that is still out there as a piece of the HVAC program that is still aging. So there will be a third piece There will be a this. third piece, just as we're discussing it. Okay. You got a question? Or? Yes, I do. Uh, how much uh, money is in the Libraries Trust Fund? We just went over that. Just 128. 128. Okay. So if, of if which we actually going to take eighteen thousand dollars for copies, mm. right? Yes. So okay. if, if we actually tried to fund this particular uh, article through the trust fund, we would basically deplete it. Yes. And uh, this is not uh, you know a nice to have kind of thing. It really isn't you know must have kind of thing for a variety of reasons, including energy efficiency and and and, and, and sanitation as well. I mean, carpets are you know not exactly. Uh, clean. So, you know, I very much support this and let's let's move forward and vote on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor of moving this? Oh, we had a motion. Recommend. Right? We yes, I it. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. All those in favor of moving it? Recommend. To recommend. Recommend. I'm getting tired. Move the recommendation. Move yes. to recommend. Yeah. Okay. All those Stay. opposed? I abstain. Okay. Well, that would be Brian and Sonny. Thirteen. And Jerry Brian and Sonny. I abstain. Voted no. They voted against. No. Twelve and one one. Twelve one. Brian Sonny and no. Jerry abstain. Anybody other than Jerry? I abstain. I got it. Amanda, thank, thank you very you. much. Good night, guys. Thank All you. right. Did you guys thank put you. the coin back there? Is that what it is? Who won? Yeah. He's only got one. Rock and paper scissors. <laughs> Well, oh, you were laughing. I assume you knew what you were laughing. You I know, know what, what it they, is. They decided amongst Please. themselves, so I'm not, I'm not changing the order. What do you do, Rock? Right? I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. He'll show you. I don't do it, so I can't explain it to you. Put I don't know what it is, though. Uh, <laughs>
Well, I have to for the point, right? Ted, thank you for your endurance. Yep. Which article? Yeah. Oh, 22. 22. Thank you. 22, Timmy. Madam Chair, I move article 22. May I have a second? Second. Michael seconded. So. Put it out of the way. Okay. I pass it to you. All right. Um, article 22 is regarding the town line revaluation. Um, we, we'd like to raise an appropriate sum of $146,000 to engage the services of Vision Government Solutions <coughs> to perform the townwide revaluation <clears throat> as required by state constitution and the Department of Revenue. Um, the, the process will run during the years of 2015-2016. Uh, values will be relative to April 1, 2016. Um, this is a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 3276 and will not lapse until the reval is completed or by March 31st, 2017, whichever is sooner. Um, the fiscal impact is estimated currently at 5.2 cents per thousand, which would uh, result in a uh, per average single family home, $16.25. And I'll answer any questions you have regarding this. All right, David, I'm going to start on your end. Required by the state constitution, the Department of Revenue, no question. Okay. Oh, uh, this is something that has to be done periodically. I'm just wondering how you're going to handle the, the floodplain area. Are you going to reflect that in, in oh, the assessment? The, the properties located within the marshland, they, those are already recognized to be located in those areas um, in 2011 when we did the last revaluation um, we cleaned up a lot of that stuff and, and categorized things correctly so this should go a lot smoother than the last one and the lot lines uh, being coordinated with GPS at this point or? yeah we have the online GIS system which you're probably familiar with um, so we those are our tax maps we do use those for, Evaluation purposes. Rich. Required by state constitution. How much of a choice? We did it in 11, Ed, right? So every five, every five years? Every five years? Are we gonna yeah. Do it? Yeah, so it's, it's RS, just to let you know, it's RSA 75 8 small a. It requires the five year mm -hmm. um, reassessment of all properties. Five years. Five years. That, they started that back. Um, around 2000, they started a cyclical program the state did, putting groups of uh, communities within a cyclical five year phase. So, once you started that, now you have to do, redo I everything it was once every 10 years. years. Mm -hmm. It used to be. It was. Mm -hmm. It was. It's, it's like I said, oh, back in 19. Five years of total reassessment. Total reassessment once every five years. Correct. Yep. At least once every five years. Some communities do it yearly. Depending on their size and their manpower. Yeah, I, I, what can I say? I did. I, I just. We went through it in 11. I was rather surprised to see they were pushing it again. But if it's five years per the RSA, what can I say? For the Constitution. Ed, question on this: the part-time position that you put into your budget. How does yes. that differ from this? Right. What's that? How does? How will that? How does that? differ or change the work that's going to be done under this contract? This this work is separate. This is the actual valuation of the properties, the rebuilding of the, the database, the setting the new values, the new base rates, <coughs> the new adjustments, uh, factors that are applied to each property. Right. The, the part-time position is to go out and gather the information <coughs> of individual properties so that we have the most accurate information to apply those to. If we apply things to inaccurate information or inaccurate properties, it throws the valuations off in a, at a quicker rate than, than the five years, potentially. I guess you got to bite the bullet. <coughs> I'm all set. Thank you. Ed. Good evening. Good evening. We had an extensive conversation on the phone regarding his hiring and relative to the reevaluation that's upcoming, and it was very informative. And as I remember it, uh, we have a computer. 
and it has in there a model. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we pump in accurate data, and out of the model generated by the computer, it's the, the reevaluation, right? That's the, the essence of it. Yeah. So yeah. what we're supplying is the computer, the model, the software, and that's what we already have, right? mm -hmm. as well as the, the data. You know, the data we're using, the old data, but we're, we're refreshing the data. That's why you have that new position. Continually refreshing the right. da data. Right. So yep. We're doing that so on a yearly basis, right. actually. So those are the three components necessary to spit out the reevaluation. So I don't understand this fourth component. Fourth component is? Um, the reevaluation. services. What is What service are they giving that's uh, not in those three-legged component that I just described? And we they, discussed at length. The, the part of the process requires um, a complete review of, um, like, a, a actual field review or final drive-by review of all the properties. Isn't that what that person you are hiring going to do? Right, but what what this also does is we send out questionnaires to commercial and industrial properties. There's a, a rental properties. We send out questionnaires regarding income. We have to gather all that information to build the model. That information changes. The market changes, rental rates change, uh, income changes. So all of the, the, the data points that we, and we plug in to value a property change. So we need to gather all that new information. We rebuild the tables. It's not just you're pushing just, you're, you're a one just gathering a, a, a fresh set of data points. Yeah, but there's, okay. there's thousands of data points. I understand there's a lot right. of data points. Right. But we were hiring a person to assist in doing that, right? Well, no, that person is uh, is is being hired to go and collect data points. No, information regarding a property, not the data. Data, data points, right? We we no we 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 gather we you, we analyze the sales that take place two years prior to the date of valuation mm -hmm. through the analysis of those sale properties. Mm -hmm which we want that information to be as accurate as possible, mm -hmm. right? The more accurate those are. Using that information, as well as the questionnaires we send out, we, we enter that information. We analyze that information. We, we have to reset neighborhood codes. We have to reset land base rates because we have to extract through current data, meaning building costs, all of those, every, every piece of a house and every piece from the foundation up, we have data point, we have uh, cost points for right. that get multiplied in to become the value. So we have to set those by analyzing those sales. It can't be done with one person. It ha it's a, it's a, takes, it's going to take us, we're, we're, we're prepared to start next fall, so they which will take us close to a year. Are, are they... Are the vision services doing the sales data? Is that what I'm hearing? They will be analyzing all the data to yes. develop the, the all the data points. Correct. Sales and building, we, uh, and remodeling, all the data. Right. We're picking up the information, but they're they're analyzing the data and entering that information, resetting all of those points. There's. It can't be done without the assistance of that company. Well, that's why I'm or wondering why company. it can't be done without their assistance. It, it's 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 time time constraints. We'd like an event to lock in here where we bought their software and only they no. know how to update it. Or what, what well, no, there's a, there's very, well, lots of revaluation companies. However, this is the company that did our 2011 revaluation. Uh -huh. Therefore, they're familiar with the town, familiar with the overall model that we have developed. And we would like to continue in that direction. Did you bid it with any other vendor? This this year, in this situation, no. Okay. We did originally in eleven. Right. I'm done. Just uh, point of curiosity: what happens if you don't do the revaluation? Um, we would be ordered to by the by the state, and they would come in and actually do it, and it would cost you know several Whatever times what we're paying. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> that's that's has happened in something. It's called you know. ransom. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it would cost a lot more. Mm. Uh, Glenn. The state came in. <laughs> oh, I'll say. Thank you. Michael. I'm, I'm a little confused uh, about 
following up on Tim's question a little bit, if we're going to go out and gather all this data. Well, we're going to gather the information, yeah. the property information, yeah. like you with your house. We're going to measure, remeasure, make sure all the de all the information on the uh -huh. property record card is correct. Okay, wouldn't you at the same time look at the card you have or the record you have of the house, what, how much I paid for it, how much I might sell it for, so all that would be current in that file. So then when we do the uh, reevaluation, all we have to do is say, well, the town properties across the town have gone up by a certain percentage, and we're done with the computer pr program. Right, but that's that's the, the basic way to look at it. But you got to remember, if the, let's say the town goes up by 10% as a whole. Okay. Now we've got 40 or 50, 50 different neighborhoods within the town. We've okay. Got, We've got the waterfront, the ocean front, we got riverfront, we've got marshland, we've got west side of town. We we set neighborhood codes for each of those areas. Yeah. We got condominiums, we've got almost three thousand condominiums. Right. We have to set so so the the condominiums might go up five percent. Right. Uh, neighborhoods on the west side of town may go up twenty percent. Okay. It depends on the market. The market May say ten percent as a whole, but the, each each neighborhood's going to have a different its own market. Waterfront may be going up different than non-waterfront. Okay, I, I follow that part, but I guess my question is if you're if it's computer driven and it knows that the beachfront is going up, say by some big amount, like twenty percent, but only Lock Road where I live or Edmond Avenue where I live only goes up by negative five percent. Wouldn't it be able to compute that? Not unless we, we have to re-enter re every bit of that data. See, the, the system now, that the way it's set up, that it's huh. set up for what it's for the 2011 valuations. Yeah. If you bought your house, if you had a $300,000 house that was assessed for three hundred dollars back in 2011, and it was sold today for $500,000, uh -huh. we wouldn't be able to make it become 500000 in the system we have. Oh. The system is set up for 2011. Oh, period. You have to rebuild that system. Oh. So we, we actually take a static file. We take the file we have. Yeah. We, we remove it and put it into another system away from the live system. Oh, okay. And build, rebuild that system to take the place of this one. So basically what we're saying here, the system is not dynamic at all. You have to go in and recharge it every five years, period. Well, that's the purpose of the farm. Rebuild it. Rebuild it from scratch. It's actually that's rebuilding ridiculous. the model. The model, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. No, I was a little confused this about is that. common re model rebuilding. This is not uncommon in the computer world. Mm -hmm. what I, and, and what's missing is this, this need for all of this data, which mostly we already have, which is validating existing data points and adding some more that we don't know about. That's the piece that I understand you have, you're hiring a separate clerk for, I don't understand the addition of this uh, this vendor. I just don't get it. Well, it's 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 the process that you need to do the revaluation. You cannot you can't do it without assistance. It's it's in right. That's why you're hiring someone. You're right. getting that assistance. Right. So I don't understand. Oh, well, he's hiring to collect data. Right. Th That's th what we're talking about. Data points. The model is done no, by no, a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get away from micromanaging not, here and, and uh, we're not discussing I'm not doing how any managing do job? Or Dick, I'm not doing any managing. Just, just Let's a quick give it thing. back. Quick thing. Two years worth of sales. We're going to have six or seven hundred sales, qualified sales. You can't develop a data point with one sale. You've, you're, now you've got 600 sales. All right. All right. You've got to analyze those sales. You've got to break them out by neighborhood, uh -huh. by site. Look, um, style. Does the modeling Watch software size. do that for you, or do you have to do that manually? You, you have to manually enter it into the system. I mean, it's you have to do all that breakout manually. That's just bad mm. software. Yeah, you have. <laughs> you do. You have to. You have to build a land curve. You have to. You have to extract. It, it, I'm I understand you. putting the data points in, but in terms of <clears throat> building the statistical model from that <coughs> the data, isn't that automated? I mean, all you're doing is typing in data entry, data points. That's all. Point I of order, Madam mm -hmm. Chairman. We've gone around the table. Now we're bouncing back and forth again. Are we going to move on, please? Let me just say that it's a process that takes close to a year to do. Mm -hmm. It's more simple. It's more complicated than. Then we can simply explain. Me being able to determine 
by pressing a button the new value. It's, it's, it's a complicated camera system with thousands of data points. Mm -hmm. That's the process. So, I mean, that's what it is. It's and necessary, and it's the five years is up, and, and you know we're looking Vision forward to. Vision comes in with a team of people. Vision will have a team of people. Team I will work. People. I will work with them, right. closely with them to. Complete do you have a contract the with them at like uh, thirty hours a month for ten months or something like that? What do you have, or what are you? What are you thinking you have? Well, you come up with that price. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I mean, the amount of time spent. I was checking with those people. No, I mean, the, the, got to remember the one hundred and forty-six thousand. Was it? X amount of people for X amount of months, or what? Uh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, well, from, from we will begin in the fall of 15. We will not end till probably September of 16. So it'll be close to a year. Are they dedicating a person or two, or what? Uh, two people, two of the manager or uh, supervisor people from Vision will be conducting the analysis and the development of the new camera system. Okay. Jim, do you have a question? <laughs> yes. I trust Jed. I think you know what you're doing. It has to be done. And in the long run, the, probably the, the, the value of the town will go up, right? Values will go up and probably make out on the deal. I mean, if, if the market stays as it is today, right. um, like I said, the 10% may be the entire town. However, there are areas that have gone up or not up as much, but yeah, it would more so be a win-win. Yeah. I'm sure you'll do a good job. All question? Sir. All set. No questions from the <laughs> audience? But I guess not. Uh, did we stop at questions. you? How do you like to move the question? Did we stop no. at you? Um, Michael? Please don't okay. stop that. Okay. I'm just going to sum it up to say we've been here in this territory before with this company before for something that's mandated by the state. <clears throat> it's that simple. Mm, I agree. All right. More or less. All those in favor? I might. Recommending? All those opposed? And abstentions. What is it? What are we doing? Well, uh, 1201. Oh, thank you. 13. Sorry, I won't vote for something I don't understand. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. But no, or do I have enough to oppose it either? We should just say. That's right. 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 The current animal control vehicle to be sold or traded in as deemed prudent by the chief uh, police chief. There shall be non-lapsing uh, appropriation per RSA 37-2, 6, and will not lapse till the vehicle purchase is made or by March 31st, 2000, 2017, whichever is sooner. Majority vote required. Fiscal impact. The estimate 2015 tax impact is uh, 0 .013 per thousand. Valuation. Chair, I move Article 28 is written. Second. Okay. Anybody have any questions? No. 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 I'm going to allow no. questions, but put your hands up because. Yeah, I have. I have a question. I have a question. Ryan. Um, Anybody from the audience? Does this come equipped with? Are you going to plow with this? Does it come with? The plow? No, we have a plow set up, and I, I believe what my intention is, if I can find a suitable vehicle to get away from using the animal control vehicle because that beat that up pretty well. Yeah. I still have the mounted truck, which during this time of the year isn't really being utilized a whole lot. Um, and I'd probably switch the plow equipment over that or try to coordinate with DPW to handle that. Yeah, I know that was a yep. problem where we were really... It just beat, it beats the vehicles yep. up. All right, thank you. Yep. Richard? What is the year of it, the vehicle, Chief? The previous one, I believe it's either an 03 or an 04, Richard. I'm sorry. I don't have my rolling stock numbers with me. I should have brought that. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. 
But that's the one that's out running around now. Two, that's the one you see Peter driving right. around in, and the other one's the one we usually have in the yard. See, see, uh -huh. We'll see it pulling the horse trail or pulling the swat trail. Yeah, yeah. That's, I was going to sit right snooping. All right, thank you. Jerry. I was just, uh, uh, my, my concern here is uh, its condition, its age, its condition, and why are we asking for it? What year do you have for the vehicle there in your rolling stock list? Uh, 2003 or four is what you said. How many miles is it that one? You got it there? 2004. So How much? 10 years. 125,000. We've done a number of repairs to that. Um, I think including the transmission, we had to replace the body at one point because it rusted off. We had to get a replacement body for it. It's just one of those things. We keep, we'll keep it, Jerry. We'll just keep spending more money on oh, it. That's what you want. Stick your feet out through the hole in the floor. That's all. You have, a, you have your maintenance record. Like how much it's costing you, Rich? I don't have them with me. I mean, that's what I'm saying. If you're telling me it's costing you too much to, uh, to, to endure and you need a new one, you should be able to tell me, Jerry, it's cost me 30000 this year. Twenty-five thousand last year. Well, let's, Jerry, let's do it. Let's do it a different way. Let's do it the old Yankee way. We're, we're in New England. We salt our roads. Two thousand four truck. Fifty k on my one hundred twenty-five thousand on it. I really don't think it's that difficult to get get my arms around it. We need to replace it at some point. Okay. You gonna do another three quarter ton Ford? No, I, I want to get away from the animal control officer ve uh, vehicle being used. Like I said, it beat that up pretty good. Um, I'm trying to work it out with uh, Public Works to have them handle the majority of the plowing. The reason we did that is just back when we first got that, I mean, they were straight out, and I it was know. just hard for them. To, so if we could have alleviated that, we would. We still have the plow. I want to move that equipment on to the mounted truck that we still yeah. have that's still in pretty good shape yeah. um, and try to utilize that for that. But it, the more I can rely on Public Works to assist, that's what I'd like to do. So what are you buying? Looking at one of those... Uh, the newer vans that got the higher back because one of the things is Peter, is when he's getting it in and out of the truck because of the construction of it, it's a high step for him, number one. And some of these animals we're dealing with, sometimes they're bigger. Okay. Um, and getting up and in and trying to move things around, it's difficult. So I want to get one of those bigger um, high, high side vans. Is it like a box? Yeah, a box. It's not it's quite <laughs> the box. It's um, some of the delivery trucks you see are uh, very similar to this. Yeah. Okay, if that's what it is, a box fan. Sprint that thing is something, though, right? The smaller one. Well, small that price would have to be a smaller yeah. one. Yeah. No, but I mean, not the traditional box fans, those new But if we, we got to we we equip it with lights, right. okay. emergency right. lights, the stripe yeah. and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Skip Steve and don't jump I'm in sorry. here. I'm sorry. Well, Seth, let me skip Steve and jump in again. I have no question. That's what they did to you. Glenn? No. I'll set. I'm all set. Set. You need this, Chief? Yes, I do. That's good. It's all good. Well, if we're going to stay in the animal control business, I need that. <laughs> all those in favor? Doesn't matter. Opposed? Not abstain. I abstain. Okay. No de not enough detail. 15. We are doing uh, 24 now. I'd like to do 26 first, if you don't mind. Uh, that's the police forfeiture fund. I'll be happy to move Article 26 as written. Second. Second. All right, this is a routine. Do we yep. really have uh, to debate all this? No. No. All right. All those in favor? What is this we're talking about now? Horse <laughs> <Please. laughs> <Please. laughs> yes. fun. you got to keep up with us, you. <laughs> all right. Against this one. Unanimous. All right. Okay. Okay. okay, moving on. Article 25, uh, part-time special officers training. Mm -hmm. Show Article 25 is written. Second. All right, now, give it back to you. I'll give it back. Shall the town of Hampton vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $99,520 for the purpose of funding an extra class of officer training beyond that which is already funded in the police department operating budget and for said funds to pay for all costs associated with recruiting, hiring, training, and equipping a group of part-time special officers for the Hampton Police Department. There shall be a non-lapsing appropriation per RSA 32,7 Six, and will not lapse until part-time special officers training is completed by March 31st, 2017, whichever sooner. Fiscal impact, the estimated 2015 is 0.036 per thousand. All right. Discussion on this one, and I'm going to start and order down the end. David? Just a question. Um, 
is this going to be for a, an additional person to do the training, the recruitment? No, what this is is, um, as we sit here today, we are actually starting a class in two weeks for the part-time academy that will come out and work this coming summer in 2015. Now, this process began in September of 14. It takes it this long to do the, the, all the things that we're required to do to get them ready for the academy, then the academy, and then they come to work that summer. What the problem is, is we've been having trouble getting sufficient number of uh, people to come forward for uh, positions with us in the traditional manner we've done it. Several years ago, um, it was an idea I came up with. I, was, I had an intern working for me that was going to uh, Salve Regina down in uh, Newport. And I asked him, would you be interested in becoming a part-time officer? He's an outstanding young man, um, and I really thought he would do a good job for us. And he, I can't, because my school studies, there's no way I can do both. Because he can't be here and going to school down in, in Rhode Island or wherever it might be. So I tried to talk to some folks up at the police academy and to the chief to give me permission to, to work on this as the way we could try to get target that group of people I thought we were missing, the college students and the teachers, the professional educators. that used to be the backbone of our agency then, and we used to get a ton of them. We, we, weren't, we weren't seeing them like we used to. And it's because of the way the academy has expanded over the years. When I went through the part-time academy in 1988, it was 100 hours. Now it's 200, plus the 100 you have to do for us. So it's, it's a really daunting task for somebody that's a student or working as a teacher. It's a tough thing to do. So we started putting it together. We talked to the folks at the academy. What we came up with in 2013 was a summer academy. We ran out at Hampton PD in conjunction with the academy up in Concord. It's simulcast. And instead of doing the Tuesday, Thursday nights like they did, and then some weekends, the normal class, they came to Hampton PD Monday through Friday, did it 40 hours a week during that summer break period for the school. So they, got done, they started in June and they got done about mid-August before they went back to school to get their certifications. Then what we did is the next spring when we did the 100 hours for the regular class, they came back and did the 100 hours with them. And we gained, I think it was an additional seven or eight officers from that program that came out and worked uh, this last summer of 14. Now because of the default budget, we were unable to do that again <coughs> during the summer of 14 to run another class. My concern is, is if, if we do default, I'm not going to be able to utilize that as a, as a way to try to get my special officer ranks back up to where they should be, because they're, they're depleted. Um, and the, the trends that we're seeing is, you know, when you look at 2014, and you'll see it when it will come out in the town report, I highlighted it, we had 20 resignations from our part-time ranks. We hired, I believe it was 13, encompassing the two classes that came to work for us. So that's a negative seven. I'm down to 30 specials as we speak. Down to what, Rich? 30. 30 on the roster. Now, I have eight currently getting ready to start the part-time academy in the next couple of weeks. So if they all survived and they all stayed and everybody stayed this summer, that would give me 38 specials. And that's still a low number for us. We should be, I'd like to be north of 45. Um, the problem is, is looking at the history, when I send out the shift pick letter to the part-time with the special officers sometime in April, I start getting some of the resignations. Some of the guys have been there a long time. Some of the guys need to take leaves of absences because of injuries and issues going on in their lives that realistically I can expect anywhere from four to ten people that are on the roster right now that are going to be looking either for time off or going to have to resign. That's just the history of, of uh, that component of the department. So I want to use this. I, I, I know um, Selectman Woolsey was, you know, we had a deep discussion about it should be in the budget. And I generally believe things should be in the budget, too. I'm not one who, who likes putting a lot of war and articles out there. I don't like doing it. But I, gotta, I have to do something. I have to do something to get those ranks back up to a sufficient level. I don't like putting it out as a war and article, but I, feel, I don't feel I have any other choice but try to get that funded through the war and article in the event we default again with the budget which has been kind of the history lately. So that, that was our motivation for doing it. No questions. I see a car and weapon solvers. Well. <laughs> I'm not that good with it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> My only question is um, uh, just how soon do these officers, even with special officers, get out into the street from when they start training? 
the normal schedule, and we'll talk about the class that's going to start here in a couple of weeks. They'll go to the uh, they'll be attending New Hampshire Police Standards and Training classes. Most of them will be held at Hampton PD. Again, it's, we are the simulcast site for the Seacoast, mm -hmm. then there's Keene, Littleton, and the Academy in Concord. <coughs> They'll do that Tuesday and Thursday nights. I believe it's uh, 6 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night, and then occasionally they have to go up to the academy for the shooting and the driving. They should come out with their certification from the state. I believe it's sometime towards the end of April or into May. Once they complete that, they come to us. We give them an additional 100 hours of department training, which includes, hey, how do you wear your uniform? How, how do you get in and out of the building? How do you access this? How do you get radios? How do you get your equipment? It takes 100 hours to get them up to speed on department policies as opposed to just the, the ordinary basic training of a police officer. So that's the 300 hours. Roughly, they come out about mid-June ready to start working with another full, with a full-time <coughs> officer or a seasoned part-time officer just to get them some time out on the street before we hit the 4th mm -hmm. of July. Um, so it's this process started... <coughs> <laughs> Two weeks after Seafood Fest, we ran our test. So it takes that long to get the things done we have to do because the process is this. You come in, you take a written test. If you pass a written test, we send you right outside. You have to do a physical agility test to meet state standards. If you pass that, we schedule you that week for an oral board. It's an interview with three officers kind of firing questions at you uh, before we can give you a conditional offer of employment. Once we give the conditional offer of employment, we have to do those really intrusive things like the background checks, the polygraph tests, the psychological tests, okay? And those take a long time to get done, and we have to get all those done by a certain date to get them into the academy. Now, the academy starts, I think, in two weeks. All of those things had to have been completed and sent up to the police academy for acceptance. I believe the due date was December 10th. Hmm. And so it takes a lot to get all that done. What we do is when we do the summer one, we take all that and we squish it. And right. so, it's a, so we're running a summer operation out of that PD. We're also running a school at the same time. So it's a busy little place, and it's busy enough in the summer when we're not doing it. But then we have, you know, we have our students in there. Um, plus, we have to keep it open to anybody else that wants to send somebody for part-time certification. So we usually get a few folks from Marine Patrol because they're the, the second biggest employer of special officers in the state next to us. Oh, nice. Um, I commend you because um, I loved this when you first this first started back well before the default budget. Yep. And uh, I think this was a great idea to Thank try you. and get some more officers. Do you, if you follow this timeline, right? How many or, and everything goes smoothly? How many officers do you project to have out on the street first of July? First of July, well, again, if everybody stays that I have on the list and everybody that's going through the academy, I would have 38. Okay. Now. I don't believe that's a reasonable number. I think we'll be closer to 30 by the time we get to the 4th of July. But this warrant article is to start an extra, another class. Yeah, okay, let me explain. That class will start in June. In June of this 2015. 15. Yeah. So this is where I'm really trying to attract the college students and the people that are teaching or people that work and then get the summer off so right. they have the time to go to the training. They'll get done probably about the third, second or third week of August. Mm -hmm. They won't come back to us until 2016 in the spring to do the 100 hours. That's where the, oh, people get lost on that. Oh, that's why they have that date out to 17 to expend, because it can go out beyond. Uh, it, tra it goes over two budgets is basically what it's going to do. And if we spend all this money and all this time and effort to project that we're going to get these offices not until 2016, what guarantee do we have? With the there, and that's the problem. And this is a question that always comes out about part-time officers. You'll hear about contracts with full-time officers, and a lot of departments will require somebody to sign a two-year agreement that if we send you to sponsor you through the police academy, you have to stay with us two years, and if you leave early, there's a prorated cost you have to pay back to the department. That's full-time. The issue you have here is when we hire, we hire a part-time officer, they get a part-time certification. So if they leave to go to Manchester, they're not taking that part-time certification to go to Manchester. They're going to have to go to the full-time academy. So there's nothing we can re get reimbursed from them. If it was a full-time certification, somebody left and we had a contract, you know, it's apples for apples, oranges for oranges. You can't really hold a part-timer to a contract and prevent them from going full time with another problem. It just there's no way we could sustain that. I don't even think it's legal. So if they come on in this June of this new program that you have, 
we and everything goes smoothly, but we still won't see them until 2016. Correct. Mm. Right. Correct. Yeah, but if they have to do their 100 hours in June, as you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So when would they actually, if they did the 100 hours, Rich, when would they hit the streets? The summer class, if we had a summer academy in 15, they would hit the streets in June of 16. Okay, so June or July. Of 16. Yeah. Now, we had a good rate of it with the last class, and I, and I agree with you, Richard. That is a, it is a risk, Where's but i got to be honest yeah. with you. I've had people, you'll see some of the names that, of resignations that we swore them in, we got them trained up, but because of military commitments and other issues, they worked one or maybe two shifts and they were gone. Hmm. That's, the and that's the normal. That's the normal. Everything that went. We we are in a serious time in law enforcement with recruitment issues, and, and this is not just Hampton. It's a national issue of finding people that want to do this job right now. It's not a very popular profession right now. <laughs> Who's kidding who? You can't watch the news without some demonstration going on and, and some issue with law enforcement. Today. Sad, it's just it's just sad. not a popular profession right now. And getting people to make a commitment now to a place like Hampton which is a seasonal part-time position mm -hmm. in getting those quality people we want to maintain the professionalism that we expect, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing. But dipping into particularly people that are professionals in other areas that want to do a little bit to give back, and that's what we have a lot of. We have a lot of teachers. We have a lot of professionals in other areas that just do this for the summer. And it's a balance. I like to have a core of those guys and some of the retirees stay on with us. That's a nice balance because then you get the young folks or the newer folks that don't have the experience that are looking to start a career, and that gives me a pool of people when the full-time openings come up to draw from because we always try to hire from our part-time ranks because it's an advantage. We know these people. We know who the stars are. We know who the people that maybe we've got to work with a little more, and it's always been an advantage to us. The problem we suffer from is everybody else has caught on to it. I went to the graduation for the last two officers uh, that graduated a couple of weeks ago, and that was great, <coughs> but there was also two other, uh, three other folks up there that worked for me last summer that were wearing other uniforms graduating from the full-time academy because they get great training, and they get some experience in a short period of time, and these departments know the job we do vetting our people. That The saddest thing is when we get to a certain point where we've invested money in training, oral boards, psychologicals, polygraphs, and then at the very end, something pops up and we can't use the person. We have to, we have to let them go. If they get through ours, our process we, for a part-time is, is the same process we do a full-timer. In the Nashua's, the Manchester's, the state police, they know that. So when a Hamp when officer comes in and says he works for Hampton PD, there he is per cup. Nashua PD, I believe, has 15 of our former specials. Manchester just graduated one uh, that worked for me last summer. It's, we, we, we run a great program and we put out talented police officers but there's a price to Don't pay, pay for the that. Price, yeah. <laughs> there's a price to pay You're for doing it. Doing too good of a job. Back the teachers that we stopped getting for all. All right, thank you, Chief. Yep. Now this is just for the like these part timers. You're you're looking to classify them for the summers. If you they wouldn't be year round or anything. Part time. Well, no. Understand. Part time officers are sworn year round. They work a schedule, a regular schedule for a 12 week period. Usually starting. It usually goes out to the uh, end of the seafood festival. Yeah. Usually starts around the middle of June, right around the same time the kids graduate is usually how it works out. Right. So when they come to work for that 12-week period, what we designate the summer season, yes. each officer has to uh, bid on three shifts a week, the same three shifts. Now, if you're a new person to the department, you're generally working Wednesday night, Friday night, and Saturday night, 6P to 2A, because those are our busy, busy nights, the fireworks and the weekends. So you work your three shifts. Now, they're subject to the contract, the CBA, they can swap shifts with people, but those are the shifts they're accountable for that have to be filled. Now, that things come up that, you know, sometimes they're sick, something comes up, you know, and we try to work with them on it. But generally, we try to get them to come in for another shift to make it up. Yeah. Um, my point was, was they, would they be working in December or January? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because you got to keep in mind, when we get done with Seafood Fest, we have events every weekend at Hampton Beach, I think, except for one right out to Columbus. So State. if you got good part-time people, you would keep them year-round? Well, I offer shifts. Okay, when we the, the schedule ends on right. the Sunday of Seafood Fest. After that, the schedule is the normal full time schedule of each. It, without getting too in depth into it, it it's minimum manning of four officers per shift. When we get to these weekend events, 
some of these marathons and the bike races, there's a lot of people. Yeah. So we put out extra. If it's not detail being paid by a, a vendor that's running an event, but I need extra people just because it's a warm weekend in September, and we get a you know we can expect you know sixty thousand people coming to the beach, I got to augment those shifts. Yeah. So when we do what we call a call list, I see. The CBA d dictates how that's called. I see. And the part-timers are part of that after the full-timers. And many of those shifts get covered by part-timers that come in in the, what we call the off-season. And most of that is in that fall time, depending on weather, and the preseason leading up to it. I notice, though, in this proposed budget, you're asking for part-time special officers, $301,000. 301,336. Your average spend rate over four years has been two hundred and six, almost a hundred thousand. He's back in the budget. I'm back in the budget. So, We're but on he's, I know that, but he's. I feel he. He might have the money right here. Well, the problem, Jerry, is if you can tell me what the weather's going to be, I go along with you. But you can't. But it's I'm talking four years. Four years average for spending. Jerry, it changes. Two oh six. You have been historically budgeted for yeah. 2 Jerry, we have this discussion every year when you're on the board of selectmen. We had this discussion when you're on the board. But you're not spending it, Rich. You're so not you're spending the money. So you're going to punish me again for not spending money. I, well, again, you've always had it. You've always gotten it. I would have been probably the lone dissenter. The season's a lot longer now, too. Okay. With all these races. I'm going to move it around mm -hmm. on this side of the table. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. He's got the money. I'm going to say this about that. <clears throat> The biggest problem that I see that we have here is we used to have a complement of what, 60 to 70? We are allowed to have up to 70. The best I've seen it was about 65 at that when I first came onto the department. So we're, 30, but then we're 30 people down. And quite honestly, I had a candidate and I thought, well, you know, October, <laughs> we're in bounds. I'll send him to HBD. He's fresh out of the military, be a good candidate for the town. And the process is long. And without having a plan such as this, we're not we're going to continue to dwindle down. We went from sixty five to sixty to fifty five. And we're on this spiral of manpower. And you gotta know that <coughs> when your manpower dwindles, you see it in other places like OT. You gotta have a plan. Unfortunately, this isn't one of those that is it without risk of losing it to other communities? But if you don't have it, you have nothing. And we're in a community that is looking pretty shiny and new lately. And um, just look at the parking revenues. You know that participation down the beach in the summer is getting higher, not lower. So you've got to put some investment in this for somewhere that is protected from a default budget or a moving budget for that matter and, and this is one avenue to do it. I agree. If, if I could put everything in the budget that needs to be in the budget and and the taxpayers could absorb the needs um, and realize that there are things that we do need and we do have to pay for but they don't. They go for the lowest number. And this is the only other way that I see to protect I this have, program. I have one more question. Wait a minute, Jerry. Yeah. We're going to go around this way. I'm not going to go backwards. Well, yeah, but I being. wasn't quite finished. You, you put and, in. Well, I was talking. And <laughs> so totally and openly I support this Warren article. Michael, and we're just going around this side. Uh, it's proved out over the years that our part-timers have dwindled significantly. If this was voted for and you had a successful summer, uh, this still isn't one year is it going to put the part-time manpower back up where you want it. No, I, I, what I anticipate, just looking at trends, um, not, again, just not here. It, 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 it's a revolving door lately. Yeah. Um, you, even other police departments, a lot of people think about coming into it and then they, you know, this isn't for me. It's a little scarier than I thought. You know, it, it looks cool, but when you're out there alone on a motor vehicle stop or you're going on a domestic yeah. and there's nobody to back you up, yeah. it's not a cozy feeling. No. It, it, it can make the butterflies go. And so, and, you know, no knock on anybody. It, I'll tell you right up front. I tell everybody that comes in, don't be afraid if this isn't for you, because it's not for everybody. Right. It isn't. 
but, <coughs> but, but this warrant article is not a one-year fix. No, I, what I would this hope to be is if this go, passes in the warrant article and we can get the budgets going in the right way that I can build this into the budget, this is where I want it to be is in the budget. Mm -hmm. But I've got to get this done somehow because if I solely rely on the normal recruiting and training, yeah. well, never, 20 resigned and I brought 13 back. in, so I was a negative back. 7 for yeah. 14. You, you'll never so, get back up there again. Right. And it's, it's right. going to be an uphill battle. Uh, I'm not kidding. It's, it's probably going to be the rest of my career we're going to be doing this. Yeah. Trying to get these numbers up to, and I said I'd be kicking my heels if I could get up 40, 45 to fifty. I'd be happy, um, but it's a start, and it's you know I'm I'm open to suggestion other ways to recruit. So if anybody's if got any ideas, let me know. If it brings in the, the teachers, as it was thirty years ago, yep. and they have local, somewhat local in New England, mm -hmm. they tend to stay a lot longer. The teachers, yeah, I, I'll have to agree with that because they're doing this as a part-time <coughs> thing right. for and the they, summer. And they like people, mm -hmm. and they're, they're out with people all summer. I'd have to support this this year, but, but I don't think it should be a warrant article every year. I couldn't agree with you more. I, mm -hmm. I, I know you're up against it. That's not my intention. It would be mm -hmm. tough to run the program. Let's try right. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can't think of anything to add to this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jim? So much to ask, so little time. <laughs> I'm going to have a cup of coffee with you, Jim. Uh, Madam Chair, the uh, Board of Selectmen have not voted on this, uh, or any of the warrant articles yet. Is that true? Um, I don't, uh, it says recommended by the Board of Selectmen for a 5 to 0. No, they have then? Yeah. Okay. No, they're not voting on any. They haven't voted on any. They will not vote on them until the, the next meeting on the 12th. Oh, all right. Well, it says 5 to 0. Right, so this. Recommended by the Board of so, Selectmen. So this and. Well, written by the Board of Selectmen, basically. But, you know, this one article and all the other ones we're talking about are subject to change. Um, now, I, I see that. And if they change, then we're subject to. Probably evaluating that vote. I, I would applaud that, Mr. Madam Chair. But where we are right now, right. I just want to. I'm a little confused in the wording of this. It says extra class of officer training. Does that mean you're going to have an extra training class with a bunch of officers in it? No, no. What are we establishing? A whole different group of people. A whole different group of people. Yeah. Second okay. What are these groups going to call? We we use the term Class A and Class B. Okay. Just one and two, because it, it was the only way to distinguish. Because again, we have the class. Let's use Class A. Class A starting in January of fifteen. They'll have this certification should be by April. Mm -hmm. Class B won't even start until June. Oh, sorry. So it's based on the starting date. Starting and ending dates. Yeah. And, and and that's what you're referring to. This extra class. Yes. Is we used to have just one, one class class of a group of people every going year through exactly and now we want to have two of them and did I hear you say that you asked the Board of Selectmen to include this in the budget no there was a discussion um, you know we're trying sitting you know just trying to come up with ideas how to get the recruitment up and and this was the the became of a conversation I had with somebody that was interning with me a couple of years ago about I thought he'd make an outstanding police officer and he was a student at a college out of state, which he couldn't attend the normal classes. Right. right. So, so the summertime. So that's what that was. So the request was never put in the budget cycle. We did last year. It failed. The but when the budget failed. No, this year. No, it's this year, no, no, because it was not in the budget cycle. Okay, that's all I wanted to yeah. know. Right. And did I and did I hear you say uh, that putting contract on part timers you don't think is legal? Is that your opinion? You don't think part time contracts are legal? I don't believe it, it would be legal to. I guess you could probably try to hit them, do it this way, that we could hold them. They have a two-year probationary period. So based on the training they get as a part-time officer, if they left the department to go to another department part-time, maybe we could do that. But that never happens. They go from part-time in Hampton to full-time with Nashua, Manchester State Police, wherever it is. So they carry, you know, they don't carry any certifications from the town of Hampton that they're going to immediately utilize in another agency. I mean, independent of certification, why can't you have an employee contract that, on a part-time that says, you are committed to work here at a minimum of two years? Well, and if you don't, the penalty is this. You could. If right. you, so if you, if you can get the collective bargaining unit to agree uh, with so that. So <laughs> we have a union complication here. Yes, because okay, they, that's they are subject, 
Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Yeah. I'm done. As a representative of the district, we are absolutely in support of this article. My concern is we just don't have enough law enforcement during the summer because of what you described. Mm -hmm. Has there been any attempt to recruit in the colleges and the criminal justice programs? That's real. Yes, we do. We we touch base with the regional in New England, the um, folks that all have the CJ programs. Uh, but we're going to have to expand our efforts. We I think the next thing we're going to do is we are planning a test right now. We're not waiting to wait to see if this passes. We are running a test. I believe at the first week of March or the last week of February, we're running the test contingent upon the budget or this warrant article passing as to whether we move forward with hiring them. So we're going to run the written test. We'll do the physical agility test in the oral boards. So we'll have a pool of people ready to go to that next phase that starts costing us money once the vote, if the voters approve this, and then we'll move forward. But in the meantime, we're going to try to reach out to those CJ programs you're talking about. We send them out through the police academy, our notices. We send them out to the individual colleges and the, the chairs at those places. But it's still not drawn enough. So sometimes I think the best recruitment is sending a, uh, an officer out that looks good in uniform and setting up a table at these fairs and these job fairs and, and talking to people. And we have a recruitment video. It's on our website that we used a number of years ago. It's from 2008, but it's still pretty good. It's one of the better ones I've seen in the state. Um, we set that up with a viewer, and we play that, and we answer questions to people about what it is and what it isn't. So Thank you. we're going to do whatever we can. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. All set for questions. I only have one question. If you, rather than having the training in the spring and the summer, why wouldn't you just have it in the summer if that's going to work really good for us? Because we're hitting different demographics. Okay. Yeah. In order for me to have enough officers that work this summer, yeah. that's the class that's going to start here in about a week or two. Okay. So they'll start in January, they'll get done in April, be ready to work for me on the street for the 4th of July. This second group that this warrant article is going to affect, they're going to be in training all summer. They're not going to work, they're going to be in training. They won't come back to me until the summer of 16 to work. So basically what the problem is, we're so short, we can't do it the way we want to. So, to a yeah, point, what are, it, it's a combination of factors. It's not one thing, okay? One of the things you got to realize is police work's become more complicated, and every year they're coming down with more mandates about what training we have to provide to officers, even the special officers, mm -hmm. okay? So, again, when I started in 1988, it was a 100 hour class. Mm -hmm. Now it's 200 hours. Now I have to add 100 hours of my own in-house training to make sure, you know, they know how to get in and out of the building, how to win. <laughs> I mean, it sounds silly, but and you have to teach people. Who's and where the restroom is. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. I've always supported going after the uh, people to fill the part-time at the beach. So I'm, yep. all, I'm all for it completely. I was just trying to figure out, you know, the, the cost and why we're shifting, and I can see it now. Thank you. And if you don't mind, Madam Chair, I'm just going to throw it out there while if people are watching this. If anybody is interested... <laughs> we have open enrollment for testing and recruitment. Just go to HamptonPD.com, and you'll see the employment package, and you can apply right online. And when we schedule a test, we'll have it. You'll get a phone call to try to schedule for the test. What's the physical requirement, by the way? It's based on Cooper standards, so it depends on your age grouping. Um, you know, old guys like us, Tim, we can pretty much walk it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, mile, I think the run is, um, for my I'm 51, so my age group, I think I get... 15 minutes and 30 seconds, I think I could probably wow, walk you're right. you at a quick, quick clip, I could probably walk it. A mile, <laughs> mile and a half. Mile a mile and a half. half. How about 75? 75, I think we carry you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the job. <laughs> 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 you take the horse. <laughs> All right. Jim, I'll ride the horse. There you go. See you good, Jim. All set. All, right. All, right. All those in favor. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Opposed? Thank you for your patience. Abstain. <laughs> okay. All out for thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And I want to thank, thank those thank you. cable tonight. Channel 22. Stay yes. with us. 22. Thank you, the cable TV. Oh, yeah. I yeah. move to adjourn that chair. Channel 22. I'll video. second that. Yeah, All right. Don't forget Thursday, live in action. Yep. Again. Again. Well, we're going to need a, min uh, a meeting just for a minute.